Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with tzatziki sauce. That's right, I'm going to show you what I think is the best method for making this incredibly delicious Greek yogurt and garlic sauce. And just how amazing is this stuff? If the current Greek debt crisis plunges the entire world into economic chaos, I would still not be mad at them based on this recipe alone. I'd be like, sure, your 401k is gone, but have you tasted this on grilled lamb? It's unbelievable. So anyway, let me show you how to do this. It is super simple. So first up, we're going to prep our cucumber. I have one English cucumber, and I am going to peel it. That's optional. Some people don't. I'm not going to seed it, though. The seeds of an English cucumber are very small and flavorless. If you're using those regular dark-skinned garden cucumbers, you probably do want to peel and seed those. So I peeled it, I trimmed the ends off, and then we're going to grate it, which, by the way, is the authentic method of production. All right, there's an old Greek saying, the first thing you see when you get to Hades are all the people that use food processors to make tzatziki. It just doesn't work as good, okay? And from that cucumber, we're going to get three things. Flesh, flavor, and fluid. But we only want the first two. I want those little pieces of cucumber flesh for the texture. And of course, I want the flavor, but I don't want that fluid. So what we're going to do after we grate it is we're going to mix in a little bit of salt. And that's really going to draw out that water. We'll let it sit there for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then we'll squeeze it dry. And then we won't have to worry about a watery tzatziki, which is the worst. So we're going to mix in the salt, and we're just going to let that sit there. And you're going to be amazed at how much liquid comes out. So I'm going to set that aside, like I said, about 10 or 15 minutes. And while we're waiting for that, we might as well go ahead and grab our yogurt. So we're going to need about two cups of Greek strained yogurt, the good stuff, the thick stuff. I mean, you can see the gorgeous body to that yogurt. That's almost borderline cheese. Just a beautiful, rich texture, tangy flavor. Just super good. So please go to the nicest grocery store in town and try to find Greek yogurt. And I say about two cups because I'm not about to dirty a measuring cup to make tzatziki. That would be silly. So I'm just going to guesstimate a couple cups into the bowl. And because I get paid by the hour, that took me about 10 minutes to get that yogurt into the bowl. So by now our cucumber should be ready. So let's go check. And there you go. You can see all that excess liquid. We don't want that in our tzatziki. Or as my Greek friend calls it, tzatziki. So what we're going to do is we're going to dump that onto a towel or a napkin and squeeze out the excess liquid. And you really should use a clean cloth napkin. That's the easiest. I'm using paper towels, which will work, but not if they're those cheap ones. Those are going to just fall apart. Of course, I have access to the very expensive celebrity grade paper towels. So I use those, but a clean napkin or cheesecloth is your best bet. So squeeze out as much liquid as you can and then add the cucumber to the yogurt. And by the way, that's one of my favorite green colors of all time. There are some colors you can only see if you cook, and that's one of them. So we have our yogurt, we have our cucumber prepped. Now we're going to add some finely crushed garlic and a good amount of it. All right, by the way, all these ingredient amounts are to taste. If you don't like how this tastes when you're done, it's basically your fault. So make sure you adjust. All right, so after the garlic, we're also going to add some cayenne, just a little pinch. I'm not sure if that's a traditional Greek ingredient, but it is a traditional Chef John ingredient. And then a little bit of freshly squeezed lemon juice. I'm going to give that a mixing at this point. And that is pretty much done except for the herb. So let's talk herb. There's kind of a controversy. All right, many people insist it should be dill. Other people suggest mint is a much better choice. For me personally, I agree with both groups. I like to put a little mint and a little dill. So I'm gonna chop up some mint leaves, maybe one part mint to two parts dill, I'd say. And yes, my cutting board's warped. And yes, it's annoying me too. I'll fix it. And if you don't like mint or dill, you could use parsley. That's what my friend Sisyphus does which is pretty good. It's just not how I roll. So you can use that too if you want. So I'm going to stir in that freshly chopped herb. And at that point, we're ready for final seasoning. So I'm going to give this a little taste. And I decided to give it a little more cayenne, just a little bit of black pepper, and a little pinch of salt. All right, so you really got to taste for the salt because don't forget, we salted the cucumber. So you're going to want to taste and adjust at this point. All right, give that one last mix, and then what we're going to do is wrap it up and not eat it for at least three or four hours. You have to let this sit and let the flavors develop. Okay, overnight's even better. But you really do want to give it some time. And then after that, of course, you're going to spoon that up into some kind of serving vessel. Maybe a little bit of a dill garnish, a little cayenne for some color. I serve mine with some homemade pita bread. I really should show you how to make that. So delicious. And there you go. Homemade tzatziki sauce, one of the world's great snacks and all-purpose condiments. This is just good on so many things. Just a beautiful, bright, tangy flavor. One of my all-time favorite dips, whether you're talking bread, crackers, vegetables. And of course, if you're anywhere close to grilled lamb, stuff that in a pita. 
spoon on that tzatziki, maybe some cherry tomatoes, and when you bite into that, you will understand the true genius of this amazing sauce, which according to my sources is a very ancient recipe. I mean, people were eating this when Athena was still a twinkle in Zeus's hair. I mean, that's way back, okay? So if you've never had this before or have only had it out at Greek restaurants, I really, really hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com to get all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Scotch eggs. That's right, I have nothing against marshmallow or chocolate, but when it comes to Easter eggs, I prefer mine a little more on the savory side. And since that holiday is right around the corner, I thought I would show you my take on this incredibly delicious treat. And speaking of Easter, if you think rising from a grave is impressive, wait until you taste these. So let's go ahead and get started. And for step one, we're gonna have to boil some eggs. And by boil, I mean steam. So what we wanna do is place a saucepan with some kind of tight fitting lid over high heat and bring just about a half inch of water to a boil. And once that happens, we're gonna carefully, very carefully, place our eggs into the pan. And the reason you wanna place them in carefully is because if you make a little hairline crack placing them in, they might burst open while they steam. So be careful. And once we have our eggs safely in the pan, we will quickly place on the lid, turn our heat down to medium high, and set our timer for exactly, exactly six minutes. And that's gonna produce what we hope is a perfectly soft boiled egg. So unlike more traditional versions, I'm not gonna hard boil the egg. Personally, I think this is far superior if the yolk is a little bit runny. And runny's not a good term, it's gonna be molten. And as soon as that timer rings six minutes, we're gonna quickly move that to the sink and hit those eggs with nice cold water to stop the cooking process. So this initial blast of water kind of stops them from cooking any further. And then we'll add some more and let them sit in that cold water until they've cooled down. And like I said, if you want to cook these hard boiled, there's no shame in your game. That is the classic method. This is an old picnic food after all. But like I said, I do prefer if the yolk is still flowing a little bit when we cut into these. But regardless of how far you cook your eggs, once those have cooled down, we will peel them. And one nice thing about this steaming method other than you can get pretty precise levels of doneness, the eggs tend to peel very easily. So we'll peel our eggs, and then one minor but important step before we move on, make sure you dry your eggs off on a towel. All right, wet eggs are slippery eggs, which could cause a problem when we try to wrap these with our sausage mixture. All right, so we'll peel and dry off our eggs, and we'll set those aside while we move on to mix up the aforementioned sausage mixture. And the base for mine is gonna be some sweet Italian sausage that I'm gonna remove from the casing, and please note, any ground raw sausage mixture is gonna work here. So this is just what I'm gonna use, because I like all the herbs and spices in the Italian sausage blend, the fennel, the garlic, the pepper, etc. But of course, we're gonna doctor it up a little bit. So I'm gonna give mine a nice healthy shake of cayenne, and I assume many of you true believers will do the same. And then I'm gonna give it a nice big pinch of freshly grated nutmeg. That's gonna give this a very, very subtle kind of breakfasty sausage aspect. And then last but not least, as far as the spices go, We'll do a pinch of dry mustard. And once that's in, we'll take a wooden spoon and give this a good mix. And you may have heard me say this before, don't just space out or daydream. Think of things you may have forgotten or things you may wanna add. And it was right about here when I realized I have some chives to use up, which would be perfect in this. So I stopped, tossed them in and kept mixing. And had I just been staring out the window at that cloud shaped like a boot, I probably wouldn't have thought to add it. But anyway, we'll give that a good mix. And by the way, I'm just doing four eggs here. This is actually enough stuffing for six, but don't worry, as usual on the blog, I will have all the exact measurements. So we'll mix that up, and once that's set, we can move on to putting these things together. So what we wanna do at this point is take a perfect amount of sausage mixture and place it down on top of a piece of plastic wrap. And as you can see, it's kind of in an oval shape. And then we'll fold over the plastic and kind of press that down with our fingers. I don't know, somewhere between an eighth and a quarter inch thick. And once that's been accomplished, we will place one egg in the center. And you didn't forget to peel it, did you? That will cause problems. So we'll place one egg down on our sausage, and then we will carefully gather that up in our palm and kind of scrunch it together like this until we're able to pull off the plastic. And then very critical, make sure you have a bowl of cold water next to you because really the only way this is gonna work is if your fingertips are damp. So you see me dipping the fingers from both hands into cold water, and that's gonna allow us to slowly but surely work that sausage meat around the egg until it's sealed. And it's not easy to see, but it will be easy to feel. Where there's extra sausage meat, you kind of push that towards the opening. And eventually, by pushing, smushing, and smearing, your egg should be completely encased in a fairly even layer of sausage. 
And again, the wet fingers are key. So just like you've heard me say when we make meatballs, wet hands make smooth balls. And it's really the same thing here. So I went ahead and encased my four eggs in sausage, at which point they're ready to bread. And for that, we will use the classic three station breading system. And you've seen us do this before. First, we're gonna coat whatever we're breading in flour and we'll shake off any excess. And by the way, this is your chance. If your scotch eggs aren't shaped like an egg, you can kind of give them a little shaping here. And then once that's been coated in flour, it gets dipped into beaten egg. And of course, we're gonna make sure it's perfectly covered before its last stop, a bowl of panko breadcrumbs or any breadcrumbs. So any dry crumb will work. And once these are coated with panko, the breading step is pretty much done. And you'll notice I'm using the classic dry hand, wet hand method, which means only one of your hands touches the egg. The other hand only touches flour and breadcrumb. That just makes everything way easier and much less messy. And then once all our eggs are breaded, we have a decision. We can fry right away, or these can be refrigerated until ready to fry. And yes, you can definitely make these the day ahead. But anyway, let me go ahead and cook one right now. Otherwise, the end of this video is gonna be very disappointing. And to do that, we're gonna carefully lower our scotch egg into 350 degree oil and deep fry it for five to six minutes. And one more thing we'll discuss on the post is how to determine how long you should cook yours. It's gonna depend on how cold these are when you decide to cook them, but also how runny you want your egg. But anyway, I fried mine for about five and a half minutes, at which point we'll pull it out and we'll transfer that onto a rack where we really, really want to let it sit at least five minutes before serving, which is not going to be easy because that looks incredibly enticing and almost worth risking third degree roof of the mouth burns. But please resist, let it sit at least five minutes. That'll give you the perfect amount of time to make a little dipping sauce if you want. So I let mine sit for about five minutes before placing it on a nest of arugula. And I serve mine next to a little mustard aioli, which I really should give you the recipe for sometime. Actually, you know what? I'll give it to you now. It's half mayo, half Dijon with a shake of cayenne. And that scotch egg, or at least my take on it, is done. Which brings us to my favorite part, the cutting open of the egg. And fair warning, there's no way you can unsee this. So let's cut in. And I was trying so hard to cut it perfectly that I didn't cut it perfectly. But it didn't matter because it looked like this. How gorgeous is that? And like I said, while you can hard boil these, for me the key is to keep that yolk a little bit soft. Like I said, runny's not the right term. It's more of a molten yolk. And then because the inside of eggs don't come seasoned, I am gonna give that a little bit of salt and freshly ground black pepper. And that, my friends, in addition to being absolutely gorgeous, is one of the best things you'll ever eat in your life. And by the way, fun fact, they say this was not invented in Scotland, but it actually comes from a North Indian recipe that translates to narcissist meatballs. And when I heard that, I was like, what does this have to do with me? But anyway, just a little historical tidbit. And while these are absolutely fine plain, I do think a little sauce is a nice touch. And because of our molten yolk, it's almost like you get two sauces. This is just a stunningly delicious thing to eat. So everybody knows what a great job Scotland does with the whiskey and the tape, but I think this scotch egg deserves just as much love. So I really do hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Macaroni and cheese, the classic Thomas Jefferson style version. So I'm going to show you the basic steps to make macaroni and cheese, and then I'm going to show you in the middle of the video how to alter the recipe depending on how cheesy you want this to be. All right, so all these traditional recipes start with a roux. We're going to melt some butter in a saucepan on medium heat, and when it sings, listen to this. Hear that? When the butter sings, when you hear it start to foam and bubble, you're going to add your flour, and it's going to make a very light roux, a very light colored and light textured roux. You're going to cook that on medium for about three or four minutes, just to cook out the starch and the flour. I'm going to add some thyme, some cayenne, some white pepper into the roux. Now, why didn't I just add that to the finished cream sauce? Because I vaguely remember in culinary school, there's some spices and herb flavors that are oil soluble, and they come out better in oil than just in liquid environment. So, uh, and I could be, you know, totally dreaming. All right, so I'm gonna cook that for another minute and then pour in a cup of milk, whisk it in really quickly, make sure the milk is cold, then you won't have lumps. Hot roux, cold milk, no lumps. Then I'm gonna add two more cups of milk and that is gonna be your basic white sauce. Now we're gonna bring that up to a simmer on medium heat and while it's coming up to simmer, I'm gonna grate in some fresh nutmeg. Get yourself a fresh nut of nutmeg and grate it yourself a thousand times better. But if you don't, put in the uh, cheap 
powdered stuff. I'm going to put a couple drips, which is different than drops, of Worcestershire sauce. And forget about this salt to taste. I'm done with salt to taste. Put in a teaspoon. All right, do not question it. You'll see when that comes to a simmer, it thickens up. We're going to let that simmer on medium-low for about eight minutes. In the meantime, you're going to grate your cheese. I have three cups of mixed cheeses. I'm using a cheddar gouda and gruyere mixture, which is quite fantastic. Turn off the heat and add your cheese in a couple additions, saving about three quarters of a cup for the top. All right, now I had these cheeses left over, but for you, I think you should use all cheddar. That's what Thomas Jefferson used, Vermont cheddar. But to any cheeses, your favorite cheeses to work. I, I think a sharp cheddar cheese really is the best, but hey, that's just me. And with the heat off, that's just going to melt in there, and it's going to make this beautiful, creamy, cheesy sauce. So all our cheese is melted in, and the last thing here, I'm going to add a teaspoon of Dijon mustard. I don't like dry mustard. All right, so now let's talk pasta. We're going to slow things down here because i got to talk to you people. Most of these recipes for this amount of cheese sauce are going to call for 8 ounces of pasta. I'm going to use a whole box, which is 1 pound, which makes a very still delicious version, but not as cheesy, not as creamy, much lighter, uh, much lower fat. If you want to split the difference, you put in 12 ounces. So adjusting the amount of pasta, you can really alter this recipe to your personal taste. Once you decide, make sure the pasta is well drained. Dump it in the casserole dish. No need to butter it. Don't believe the hype. It's not going to stick. Well, it might stick a little bit. It's okay. You just scrape it out. You're going to pour in your cheese sauce, distribute it. Then you're going to sprinkle over the rest of the cheese. Then the secret to a perfect macaroni and cheese crust. You only want a half a cup of breadcrumbs, and you want the Japanese panko breadcrumbs. You too can find them. Yes, they're in the store. Yes, don't argue. They're in the Asian section of your grocery store. Then just a tablespoon of butter. Mix it up, put it on top. That's going to adhere to that layer of cheese on top, and you're going to get the best crust ever. You're going to put that in a 400 degree oven. That's kind of hot, I know. But I want the top to caramelize and brown. I mean, I'm not trying to cook the inside. I don't know why you would cook this for like an hour at, you know, 350 or a lower temperature. I'm just trying to brown the top. Everything else is cooked. At 400, that took me about 20 minutes. Just watch it. When it's brown, take it out, and you're done. Perfectly crisp crust. All right, I'm going to let this cool just a little, and then I'm going to dish it out, and it is truly amazing. Now, see the holes in the pasta? See that little hole over there on the left, the elbow? For the one-pound package of pasta, those are not going to be filled with cheese sauce. The pasta is going to be very nice, very tasty, very cheesy, but it's not going to be like running with cheese sauce. If you use the eight ounces of pasta version, you will have a lot more cheese sauce, okay? So it's up to you. Thomas Jefferson, the inventor of macaroni and cheese, also the author of the Declaration of Independence, he and our founding fathers fought for our right to put in as much or as little macaroni in our macaroni and cheese as we damn well please. So never forget the principles on which this country was founded. And that's it, macaroni and cheese. How easy was that? All right, go to the site, get the ingredients, and as always, enjoy. Shakshuka! That's right, we're doing breakfast for dinner. Although technically this was originally a dinner that became a breakfast. So I guess we're really doing dinner for breakfast for dinner. But regardless of when you serve this North African dish, it's always comforting and delicious and never not fun to say. In fact, sometimes when I'm not even making this, I'll just yell for no apparent reason, Shakshuka! And now that you know about this, I'm assuming you'll probably do the same. But anyway, let's go ahead and get started. And what we'll do is we'll place a heavy skillet over medium high heat and drizzle in a little bit of olive oil. And as usual, by a little bit, I mean a lot. And then to that, we're going to add two ingredients, some diced onions, which is very traditional, as well as some mushrooms, which are definitely not traditional. And we do also want to add some salt at this point. And while the mushrooms are not a classic addition, I really think they're amazing in this. And for me, just make the dish more savory. And what we want to do here is cook these onions and mushrooms, like I said, over medium-high heat, for I'm going to guess in, say, about 10 minutes or so, until they give up any and all excess liquid and start to turn golden. And as they start to take on a little bit of color, that flavor is going to get meatier and, in my opinion, way more delicious. So like I said, we're going to take our time and we're going to cook them until they look something like this. So those are looking pretty good right there. And at this point, we can introduce another key ingredient, our peppers. 
And we're going to use three kinds, even though it only looks like two. I have some diced sweet red bell pepper, as well as a red Jimmy Nardello pepper, which is also mild. And then, as you can probably see, one sliced jalapeno. And we will stir that in, and we'll cook that for about five minutes until those peppers start to soften up a little bit. And then once that's happened, before we add our tomato product, what we want to do is add our spices and cook those for a couple minutes in this mixture. So at this point, I'm going to add a spoon of cumin, as well as some paprika. And by the way, any kind of ground chili pepper would work here. We're also going to do a little touch of turmeric, which by all reports is super good for you, and you should try to eat a lot of. We're also going to add some cayenne, of course. You knew that was coming. And then last but not least, a little bit of freshly ground black pepper. And we'll stir in those spices, and we'll let those cook for a minute or two in this mixture to, as I like to say, wake up the flavors, which really has to do with the flavor of those spices sort of infusing into the oil, as opposed to adding them after the tomatoes go in when everything's kind of wet. And does it really make that big of a difference? Who knows, but why take any chances? So like I said, we'll cook those spices for a minute or two, at which point we can finally add our crushed tomatoes. And of course, unless you're using fresh tomatoes, you're going to want to use those San Marzano tomatoes. And sure, I guess you could use a lower quality if you wanted. That's up to you. But remember, you're in charge of making sure your shakshuka is off the hookah. So suit yourself, but I'm going to go with the San Marzanos. And then because I do want to simmer this mixture for about 15 or 20 minutes, I'm going to go ahead and stir in a nice splash of water so things don't thicken up and reduce too quickly. And I would say about medium heat's probably the best. But you can adjust that up or down a little bit depending on what you're seeing in the pan. But I do want to let this simmer about like that, stirring occasionally, for like I said, about 15 or 20 minutes, to really give those veggies time to soften up and sweeten up, and just generally give all those flavors time to meld together. Okay? So I let mine simmer, stirring occasionally, and approximately 15 to 20 minutes later, it looked like this. And by the way, even though we added some salt at the beginning, you definitely want to taste this for seasoning before we add our eggs on top. So make sure you check this, especially for salt. And then once we've determined this mixture is cooked long enough, what we'll do is we'll prepare the surface for our eggs. And what I mean by that is we're going to take a spoon and make sort of a depression in that sauce, one for each egg we're going to place down, which in my case is going to be five. So I'm going to make five little wells into which we're going to carefully place our eggs. And to do that successfully, here is a huge and very important tip. Do not crack the egg directly into your sauce. Crack it into a ramekin first, because you're going to be able to see it before it goes in here. Okay, so very important. Crack it into a ramekin first. That way there's no possible way the yolk can break. Whoops. Looks like that one broke anyway. So let me rephrase that. By using a ramekin, you can lessen your chances of a broken yolk. But it still could happen. And yeah, I probably should have stopped the camera and fished that one out and had them all come out perfectly, but I didn't. And no, it has nothing to do with ethics or keeping it real. It has much more to do with laziness. Plus, as you'll see, it's really not that big of a problem. So I really wasn't that upset, allegedly. And then once our eggs are down, we will give each one a little bit of seasoning with some salt and freshly ground black pepper. And then all we need to complete this dish is to keep simmering this on about medium heat, I'd say, until our eggs are cooked to our liking, which can be, for someone like me, very, very soft, to others who like it cooked all the way through like a hard-boiled egg. And while some people like to pop this in the oven to finish the eggs, I prefer to just do it right on top of the stove with a cover, except I don't have a cover that fits this pan. So in that case, I just use a sheet pan, which totally works fine. And this is not going to happen super quick, but you definitely don't want to go anywhere. you got to pay attention. So we'll keep that covered, and then every once in a while, we'll give our shakshuka a little looka. And right here was kind of getting close. And one thing to keep in mind here, if you want your eggs soft like I always do, you're definitely going to want to err on the side of taking this off a little too early because that mixture is super hot. And by the time you plate this up and find some toasted bread, that egg is going to continue to cook. So I gave it a few more minutes. And then right here, even though it was still underdone, I could tell I was only a couple minutes away. So I proceeded on to the final touches, which really you could do at any time, but I tend to do it at the end here. So I'm going to finish this by crumbling over some feta cheese. To be honest, I usually prefer goat cheese, but this time I did go with feta cheese, which is very wonderful. And then besides the cheese, I'm also going to give it a little drizzle of extra virgin olive oil. It's going to add just a little bit more richness and flavor. And also freak out my guests because it looks like raw egg yolk. And then last but not least, a little bit of fresh herb. I'm going to go with Italian parsley, although I believe cilantro is probably more traditional. And that's it. As soon as you think your eggs are perfect, your shakshuka is done. 
So let's go ahead and serve this up while it's still nice and hot. So I usually recommend putting some sauce down in the bowl first, and then topping it with an egg, and then possibly more sauce. And then of course we'll finish that with the mandatory slice of toast. I mean, otherwise, what are you gonna sop up all that goodness with? You gotta have some toast. And then my final touch was a few more drops of olive oil. And yes, that was mostly for the pictures. And once I'd taken a few of those, it was time to dig right in. And you'll notice that even though those eggs were pretty soft when we pulled it off the stove, because that mixture underneath is so hot, by the time you serve this up, it should be perfect. And as I mentioned, I do like my yolk a little runny, so this was just perfect for me. Other people like to cook this all the way through, which is fine. Who am I to judge your eggs? But this is exactly how I like mine, and that is just extraordinarily delicious. That beautifully aromatic, spicy sauce, just an amazing thing to poach those eggs in. And while admittedly not maybe the most beautiful thing to watch someone eat, this is just so delicious, so hearty, so satisfying, so comforting. It's just no surprise at all it became such a popular dish in that part of the world. Just a fantastic thing to eat, whether it's for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. In fact, there's an old Tunisian saying that basically roughly translates to anytime is shakshuka time. And I could not agree more. So I really do hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Garlic and ginger, Clifton Springs, chicken wings. And uh, why it's called that? Well, you're going to have to read the post. Let's get started. First, we need a chicken wing anatomy session. That top part there, the part that attaches to the chicken is called the drum. The middle part is called the flat. And the end is called the tip. So we're going to break this in three pieces. You're going to go with your knife between the drum and the flat until you can kind of see where that joint hinges. Just cut it until you can see the joint. Okay, see that? Now that's kind of a ball and socket type joint. And put your knife right in between and it will go through like butter. So the other end, the uh, what's called the tip, you're going to cut that off right at the joint again. Just move it until you can see it. And we're going to throw away the tips because uh, we don't want them. But you can make soup with those. So there's five pounds of chicken wings separated into the drum and flat. And I'm going to stop saying drum and flat now. We're going to season that with some black pepper and salt because I'm not going to season my uh, flour. I want the seasoning on the chicken. That's some Frank's hot sauce. That's the official chicken wing hot sauce. We're going to put a few tablespoons of that. Give that a toss. And then we are going to pour in just a little bit of vegetable oil. Now I'm going to use a grapeseed oil. You want something neutral, okay? Something with, that doesn't really have any flavor. And we're going to coat those real lightly with the oil. And then what we're going to do here is we're going to coat these in flour and oven fry them. So we're going to fry these on a oiled pan. So put some aluminum foil on them, two half sheet pans. All right, I'm going to put a nice rounded cup of plain flour in a garbage bag or in a large plastic bag. I'm going to dump in my five pounds of wings. All right, I'm going to bunch it up so it doesn't uh, fly all over my face. And then I'm going to shake it. And yes, shake and bake. Very funny. All right, so we're going to shake this till they're all coated. You can kind of feel them in there. And uh, just make sure they're all really well mixed so there's no like wet spots on them. And there you go. Those are now floured or dredged, as they say in culinary school. You're going to take those out. And again, I'm going to show you one pan at a time here. But you're going to do two sheet pans, nice and evenly spaced. Now the pan is oiled, as you saw. But you also want to spray some of that oil onto the chicken wing itself so it fries nice and crisp. These are going to go in a hot oven, okay, 400 degrees, and those are going to bake for a half hour, and then we're going to turn them over. Now, they're not going to look very good at this point, all right, but don't be scared. They've got a half hour to go. The fat and the connective tissue is starting to break down the chicken wing. That's going to make them sticky and start to caramelize and get crispy in the oven. So while those are going for the second 30 minutes, we're going to make our ginger garlic sauce, which, strangely enough, has some crushed garlic and some ginger so that's up to you. I like a lot of both. I'm going to put in a big spoon of hot sauce, which is optional, but I think you should put it. That's a sambal, which is an Asian hot sauce. I got a half a cup of rice vinegar, very important, and a half a cup of packed brown sugar, and just a, maybe a teaspoon, a splash of soy. All right, so that's just to bring out the flavor in that glaze. Again, give this a taste when it comes to a boil, and you can adjust the seasonings if you want. And as soon as it's boiled, and as soon as you're happy with how it tastes, turn it off. All right, now our chicken is out of the oven. It's been an hour, half hour each side. 
They're nice and crispy and uh, really, really, really nice texture. You're gonna pour over half the sauce, over half the wings. You're gonna toss it in the bowl and they should be coated evenly. Now you don't have to do the flip toss here. I'm just showing off. You can just move them around with a spatula or with the tongs. All right, so we're gonna pour those back on the sheet pan and just let them cool because people will go to grab these because they smell and look so delicious. There's nothing worse than third degree garlic ginger burns. Okay, let these cool for about five to 10 minutes. The sauce will soak into the coating. It will stay kind of chewy and crispy and crunchy. And uh, oh, so good. All right, so that's Clifton Springs chicken wings. Put them on your serving tray and uh, crack open a couple beers. Do not dip these in blue cheese with celery sticks, please. Please don't do that. Anyway, go to the site to get more info if necessary. And as always, enjoy. Greek lemon chicken and potatoes. That's right, I've never catered to anyone's big fat Greek wedding, but if I did, I'd probably serve this. Not only is it easy to make and incredibly delicious, chicken and potatoes are pretty cheap. So not only would everybody love it, it would be pretty profitable. But happily, I do not cater. Instead, I do whatever this is. But anyway, let's go ahead and get started. And in the words of the Greek philosopher Plato, the beginning is the most important part of the work. And that is certainly true with this recipe. So what we want to do first is put our chicken pieces in a mixing bowl. And what I have here is one whole chicken cut into sections. And as amazing as this came out, ideally you're going to use all dark meat for this. And I'll go over that on the blog post. But thigh and leg sections work even better in this recipe. But alas, I had a whole chicken, so that's what I used. Did I just say alas? But anyway, no matter which chicken parts you're using, what we need to do is season them up generously. So we'll start with a whole bunch of kosher salt, followed by some freshly ground black pepper. And then we'll do some dry herb. We'll do a little bit of rosemary and a whole bunch of dry oregano. And because someone will ask, of course you could use fresh herbs in this. But this is one of those recipes where the dry herb just works better. We're also gonna to wanna to do a little bit of cayenne, as well as a fair amount of minced garlic. And then we'll finish off what's basically a marinade with some freshly squeezed lemon juice. And I repeat, freshly squeezed, as well as an equally large amount of olive oil, preferably Greek. And that is pretty much it. So at this point, if we were just roasting chicken, we'd mix this up and proceed, but we're not, we're doing chicken and potatoes. So at this point, we're gonna introduce some peeled and quartered russet potatoes. Yukon Gold are also nice in this, but personally, I'd stay away from the waxy potatoes like the red ones. Those don't seem to work quite as well. And once those are in, we wanna give everything a thorough mixing, but not with a spatula. Please use your hand for this. Actually, use both hands for this. But because I'm always trying to keep my camera free of deadly chicken juices, I went with a spatula and it was as annoying as it was time consuming. But eventually I got it mixed. And once it is mixed, you can let this sit in the fridge for a couple hours if you want, which seems to be a popular option. Or if you want, you could cook this right away, which is what I'm doing. And it still comes out incredibly good. So let's go ahead and transfer this into a lightly oiled, large roasting pan. And I generally like to place the chicken in first, skin side up. And I'll make sure those pieces are nicely distributed before filling in the blanks with our potatoes. And by the way, do not discard any of the marinade. We're gonna spoon that over in a minute. But before we do an incredibly important step, we're gonna drizzle in about a half a cup of chicken broth or water, which is gonna prevent the lemon and garlic from burning onto the bottom of the pan. It's all right if that stuff caramelizes onto the top of the chicken, but if all that stuff blackens to the bottom of the pan, when we serve this with the pan drippings later, it's not gonna have that beautiful fresh lemon herb flavor we really want. So we'll pour in a little bit of broth, at which point we'll spoon the rest of the marinade over the chicken pieces. And not just the chicken pieces, you wanna spoon a little bit over the potatoes too. And once that's been done, this is ready for the oven. So let's go ahead and transfer this into the center of a 425 degree oven for about 45 minutes or so, or until the chicken is cooked through. And what we wanna do after about 20 minutes is pull it out and give these pieces of chicken and potato a little toss in the sauce. And please note, we're just tossing, we're not flipping. Okay, we still wanna end up with the skin side still up. And by the way, you can do this three or four times during the cooking process if you want. I just did it once, but feel free to do this another couple times if you want. And once that's been accomplished, we'll go ahead and pop that back in and continue until the chicken is beautifully browned and cooked through, which is what I'm looking at right here. And we could at this point serve this as is, it would be magnificent, but we wanna make this even more incredible. Hey, come on, we're trying to make the Pantheon. So what we'll do is we'll transfer our chicken to our serving platter and keep that warm for a minute, because what we wanna do is switch our oven onto broil or up to the highest heat setting you have, and we'll give those potatoes one more toss in that goodness. And then we'll toss those back in the oven or under the broiler for a couple minutes to finish the crustification. And not only is that gonna put those potatoes over the top texturally, it's also helped to continue caramelizing 
all that deliciousness in the bottom of the pan, which of course we're going to utilize. So at this point, we can add our now perfect potatoes to our chicken pieces. And then all we're going to do to finish this off is add a splash of water or chicken broth to the roasting pan to sort of dissolve and loosen up all that goodness, which we will then strain and spoon over our chicken and potatoes. And by the way, if you want, you can put your flame on like medium here just to keep everything nice and hot while you're doing this. And of course, you can taste for seasoning at this point. You might need a little more salt, but I predict it's going to be perfect. And once that's set, like I said, we're going to strain it and spoon it over our platter. And then we'll finish off with just a little bit of freshly chopped oregano, if you have some. And my version of Greek lemon chicken and potatoes is done. And I'll admit it right now, the chicken is really just an excuse so I can enjoy these potatoes. With that brown crusty surface outside, and then that soft creamy delicious inside, which is soaked in all that flavor from the chicken and the herbs and the lemon and the garlic. And while the potatoes are my favorite, the chicken is equally delicious. In fact, I'm going to take a bite from what would be the driest, most overcooked part, that little piece of white meat from the breast still attached to the wing. And even that piece was moist, tender, and incredibly tasty. But anyway, let's plate this up properly. That was just a little tease. Although, since this is Greek food, I believe it's referred to as a Socrates. But anyway, like I said, let's plate this up for the official taste. And while I usually enjoy as is with just a little bit of those pan drippings over the top, if you're in the mood, some kind of cold yogurt sauce is also very nice served with this. All right, I had a little bit of tzatziki sauce from some leftover takeout, so I spooned a little bit of that over. But just a little bit of Greek yogurt with some garlic in it would also be nice. So that's totally optional and up to you. You are the Plato of your plate, bro. So that's for you to decide. But no matter how you serve it, I think you'll find this to be one of the most delicious roast chicken and potato recipes you've ever tasted. So simple, so satisfying, and so delicious that usually when people learn how to make this, they don't just make it once. They make it like once a week for the rest of their lives. It's that good. So I really do hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Dutch babies. That's right, unlike actual babies, these are not annoying to have at your table at a restaurant. In fact, quite the contrary, you want to be seated next to these. And for a breakfast or brunch item that looks as impressive as this, you're not gonna believe how incredibly easy it is to make. Actually, I take that back. You will believe it because you're about to see it. So let's go ahead and get started on what's also referred to as a German pancake. And to do that, we're gonna start by cracking three room temperature large eggs into a blender. And a quick tip here, I didn't have room temperature eggs. I forgot to take them out ahead of time. So all I did is put those eggs in a bowl of warm water for a couple minutes, and I had what were basically room temperature eggs. So just a little trick, cold eggs don't work quite as well in this recipe. And then after the eggs get cracked in, we're also going to need some room temperature milk. Actually just microwave mine for like 10 seconds to take the chill off. So we'll dump in some milk. I'm also going to put a little bit of vanilla and a little pinch of salt. Some people like to put a little pinch of cinnamon or other spices. I don't, but that's really up to you. And then of course we're going to need some flour. And I sure hope when I pour this in, it doesn't wreck my shot. Well, that was unfortunate. We better switch to the ceiling cam. There we go. And believe it or not, that's it. Just a very, very simple batter. And then we'll go ahead and take that over and blend this completely smooth. And by the way, this amount of batter is a little less than you get in a traditional Dutch baby recipe. And I will get into that on the blog a little bit. But anyway, we're going to blend that on high speed until it's very, very smooth. With this kind of stuff, it's usually not a bad idea to stop halfway through. Give it a little scrape down with the spatula just to make sure there's no flour clumps stuck to the edge or to the bottom. But mine was in good shape. So I blended for a few more seconds. And once your batter is completely smooth, just turn it off and reserve until needed, which is gonna be very soon. So once your batter is set, you're gonna preheat a 10 inch cast iron skillet on very high heat. And when that pan is extremely hot, we're gonna pour in about two or three tablespoons of clarified butter, which as you can see, I did not clarify very well. So I obviously had a little bit of water mixed in with this butter fat. And for that, I was rewarded with extreme splattering. Seriously, a Dutch baby could have done a better job of clarifying that butter. So I could have probably edited that out. But you know I secretly like showing you my screw-ups. But anyway, we're going to dump in some clarified butter. And then we're going to go ahead and pour our batter right into the center. And if your pan was properly heated, it should really bubble up like that. And at that point, we're going to very, very carefully transfer this into the center of a 425 degree oven for about 20 to 25 minutes, or until it looks like this. It should be well browned and extremely, extremely poofy. Oh, by the way, if any of your guests are gonna be gramming this, which by the way is what us cool kids call Instagramming these days, 
or so I've been told by cool kids. But if you do want to catch it in its most vertically impressive state, you're going to want to be right there when it comes out of the oven. And at that point, we're going to finish this off in traditional style with some butter, lemon, and sugar. And by the way, I like to leave it right in the pan for two reasons. It's going to keep it nice and hot. Plus, you're going to get these incredible sound effects as you finish this off. So first up, we're going to drizzle on and brush over some melted butter, which, as I just mentioned, sounds very cool. And you can also hear how crisp that surface gets as I'm brushing this on. So we'll do a generous application of butter, followed by the juice of half a lemon. By the way, I'm using a Meyer lemon, a very sweet, delicious type of lemon. Try to use that if you can find it. And again, we're getting those incredibly enticing sound effects. And then after the fresh lemon, we're gonna finish off with some powdered sugar. We're gonna want a very, very generous dusting. Remember, there's no sugar in the batter, so powder it good. And once we've done that, our Dutch baby is officially done. That's pretty impressive looking. So let me go in and cut a little wedge to try. And they say one of these 10 inch pans will produce four portions, which is pretty close. They're only off by two. But of course, portion size is up to you. You're the mother of this Dutch baby. And you'll be the one that decides what's best for this delicious child. And you can really see in this shot the magic of the Dutch baby. It's that play between the crispy and the custardy. And if this was just Michelle and I, we'd eat right out of this pan. But let me plate one up so I can take a few extra pictures and also go in for the official taste. And of course, if you do plate it up, no reasonable person would have a problem with you drizzling over a little more butter, a little more lemon, maybe a little more powdered sugar. And above and beyond the great textures here, this has a beautiful crepe-like flavor that would be equally as delicious with different toppings. We went with the traditional lemon butter sugar here, but any kind of fruit syrups, fresh fruit, maple syrup, etc., will totally work here. And of course, if you're a real player, you're already brainstorming dozens of alternative sweet and savory variations which I assume if they come out amazing, you'll share with me so I can take some credit. That's only fair, all right? So I really do hope you give these a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Nashville hot chicken. That's right, when I first heard about this stuff, I thought it was some kind of internet hoax. I was supposed to believe that they take crispy southern fried chicken and then before serving it, they drench it with cayenne-infused lard? I mean, that sounds totally made up, and possibly illegal. Well, as it turns out, it's not made up, and completely legal, and one of the most amazing fried chicken dishes you will ever taste. So I am very excited to show you my version, and that's going to begin with what's basically a marinade. So we're going to go ahead and add some buttermilk to a mixing bowl. And by the way, for the record, in the original recipe, this is just regular whole milk. But I do prefer the buttermilk. And then as you may have noticed from the intro picture, this is always served with pickles, which of course come in a brine, and I'm going to add some of that brine right into this mixture, followed by a very generous amount of hot sauce. And that one people like to use on wings is very popular for this, but I don't like that brand. Shh, don't tell them, they might be a sponsor. So I'm going to toss in a less popular, but what I think is a more delicious Louisiana hot sauce. And then last but not least, we will crack in one large egg, and then we'll take a whisk and mix that thoroughly. And as soon as all that's been completely combined, our marinade is done and ready for our chicken, which as you can see here has been cut into the traditional eight pieces. Of course, we have your two legs, your two thighs, a couple breasts, and a pair of wings. And I know I've showed you guys how to cut up a chicken before, so I'll try to remember to add a link to the blog post. But anyway, we're gonna need one cut up chicken, which ideally you've tossed with some salt the night before and left it in the fridge. But I'm gonna be honest, I didn't do that. Since this was kind of a last minute decision to film, and as you'll see, this is still going to work out beautifully, but if you can plan it out, seasoning the night before is better. And that is another issue I will explain in detail on the blog. But either way, what we'll do is go ahead and pour that marinade over our chicken, and then take our tongs and make sure all that's mixed around very well. Okay, chicken pieces are famous for their nooks and crannies. So I'm editing this, but take a minute or two and make sure all those pieces are thoroughly, thoroughly coated. And then once that's been accomplished, what we'll do is wrap this and transfer this into the fridge for two to four hours. Now, can you do it less time? Yes. Can you do it more time? Sure. But I only guarantee these same results if you do it two to four hours. So we will pop that in the fridge, and while we're waiting, we can go ahead and do our seasoned flour, which is super easy, because all we're gonna do is take some all-purpose flour and add in some fine salt. And sure, if you want, you could use kosher, but I much prefer the taste of the fine. Yes, that was a joke, at least to some people. But anyway, we're gonna add some salt to the flour, and we'll give that a stir. And in case you're wondering why we're not adding a bunch of other spices into this, that's because we're going to be finishing this by brushing on that highly seasoned spicy sauce. So we're just going flour salt here. And then once that's prepped, and assuming our chicken is marinated long enough, we can go ahead and pull that out and start the dredging. 
double dredging to be more exact. So how I like to do this is to pull that chicken out of the marinade and sort of wipe off any excess and let it drip back into the bowl before placing that on some paper towels. Because what I wanna do here is sort of blot off that excess liquid. And I'm doing that for two reasons. Since this is gonna be double dredged, meaning it's gonna go in the flour twice, I like to do that first application of flour without the chicken being too wet. So we'll pull that chicken out of the marinade and sort of blot it off a little bit with the paper towels. And then the other reason, because we didn't do the overnight seasoning with the salt, I'm gonna give these pieces a little extra seasoning with salt right here. And at that point, we can start the double dredging process. So we will take our chicken pieces along with our reserve marinade. Oh, don't throw that away. We're gonna need that. And we can start this double dredging as shown. So we'll take a piece of chicken and toss it in our flour. And we'll roll that around until it's completely coated and there are no wet spots to be seen. And we'll go ahead and shake off the excess and pop that right back into our marinade. And we'll kind of toss that around until it's coated and then let most of the excess drip off before returning it back to the flour for the second dredging. And once that's been thoroughly and thoughtfully coated a second time, we will transfer that to a rack and that's it. Okay, so to summarize, first we make it wet, then we make it dry, then we make it wet, then we make it dry. And that really is the key to Nashville hot chicken perfection. And speaking of keys, we wanna make sure we're using the old wet hand, dry hand method. Okay, you see how I'm using my left hand just for the flour and my right hand just for the milk mixture? That is definitely the recommended technique. Otherwise, it's just super messy to work with. I mean, as it is, it's already super messy, but we don't wanna make that worse by having our fingers all gunked up. So using that old wet hand, dry hand will continue on until all our chicken has been double dredged. And then what we're gonna do next, which is a very underrated step, is we're just gonna let this sit out on the countertop for 15 minutes to sort of dry out a little bit. All right, that's gonna give this time for that coating to kind of set up. And I really think you do get better results. And it really does help if you use a rack like I'm using here, so we get some air circulation underneath. But if you don't have a rack for whatever reason, you could just crinkle up some foil, that works too. And then what we wanna do during that 15 minutes is go ahead and make our sauce. So into this pan, I'm gonna to toss some butter and some lard. I don't believe I've ever said that before. And then to that, we're gonna add a little touch of cayenne. Actually, we're gonna add a whole spoon. You know what, make it two spoons. And by the way, if you think that's an insane amount of cayenne, the actual original recipe is about three or four times that much. So I'm gonna do this only with two tablespoons of cayenne. And then we'll also do a little bit of garlic powder, as well as some sweet paprika. And then speaking of sweet, we wanna do a little bit of brown sugar and a touch of salt, as well as some freshly ground black pepper. And once we have all that together, what we'll do is place this over medium high heat. And all we need to do is cook this for a couple minutes stirring until those fats melt and everything gets heated through. And sure, this might look a little scary, but don't be afraid. The food gods hate a coward, so have faith. And if everything goes according to plan, it should look something like this. And once that's set, we'll turn off the heat and just keep that on the back of the stove warm until we need it. And assuming that our chicken has now sat out for 15 minutes, we can go ahead and start frying. And today we're gonna to be doing that in a cast iron skillet, which will fill about a third of the way up with vegetable oil and heat to 350. And once our oils reach temperature, we will carefully place in our chicken, skin side down, at least for the breast and thighs. Legs and wings don't matter. And of course, once we add that in, the temperature of the oil is gonna drop, but then it's gonna come back up. And what we're gonna to try to do is maintain a temperature of 325, which could mean you're just gonna stay on medium high heat, but maybe not. So that's gonna be you cooking, adjusting that temperature, tweaking it a little bit up, a little bit down. And as far as the cooking time goes here, it's gonna be about eight to 10 minutes per side, but I guarantee nothing, and you really should check with a the thermometer and go to at least 160 internal temp. And if you want, feel free to turn this just once, but that's not how I do it. What I like to do is let the first side go for about six or seven minutes. Then I will go ahead and turn those over and I'll give that second side about six or seven minutes. And then I'll turn it back over for another minute or two. And then if it needs more time, I might even turn it again. And what I think happens with these additional turns is because some of that coating is above the surface, it cools down a little. When we turn that back over, we get kind of a twice fried effect, which is gonna result in an unbelievably crispy, crunchy chicken. So that's how I do it, and I have great results with that. And if you're afraid it's gonna absorb more oil that way, don't be. It really doesn't, and even so, did I mention we're gonna brush this with lard? So I'm not sure that's really gonna be a problem. And of course, if you fried chicken before, you know all the pieces aren't gonna finish at the same time. So I pulled my wings out first because they finished first, and then I continued on until everything was cooked perfectly. 
And again, to be safe, you'll want to check with the thermometer. We're shooting for at least an internal temp of 160. So once we've determined our chicken is cooked long enough, we will remove that to a rack to drain. And by the way, in case you were wondering, Noah, I was not trying to be artistic with this shot, where you blur the foreground and then focus on the background. That's really more so me not knowing what I'm doing. So at this point, let me go ahead and distract you by grabbing a fork and letting you hear just how crispy this stuff comes out. But as good as that sounds, it tastes even better. So let's go ahead and plate up. And there's really only one acceptable way to do this, and that's on top of sliced white bread, okay? The cheaper, the better. Okay, we want something that contains no fiber and even less nutrients. So we'll place down our hot fried chicken on what technically qualifies as bread. And then we will finish this up by generously brushing over our spicy sauce, preferably to both sides. And by the way, down in Nashville, they literally dunk the pieces of chicken in like vats of this stuff. So I'm sure there's a few people down from those parts that are laughing at me with my dainty brush. So if you'd rather toss these pieces with the sauce or dip them in, that's up to you. You are the T-bone pickings of how to sauce your Nashville hot chickens. But anyway, we're going to generously apply our spiced butter lard mixture. And then right here, if I was a famous food photographer, I could have left those drips. But I'm not, so I cleaned them up. And then for a final touch, we'll finish this off with some slices of bread and butter pickles. We definitely want something on the sweet side here, so we can balance the heat from the cayenne. And that is it. Our Nashville hot chicken is done. And looking absolutely stunning. So let me go ahead and grab this napkin and silverware and not use them. And I'll go ahead and grab a leg and bite into what is probably the best fried chicken ever. Just insanely crispy. That meat is moist and flavorful thanks to that spicy buttermilk marinade. And then permeating everything, we have that cayenne and spice infused butter and lard. That is just an absolutely incredible bite of food. And because I was in a hurry and only brushed sauce on one side of the chicken, I'm going to stop and brush on a little more. And I believe in the business this is called we're larding. But anyway, that's it. My take on Nashville hot chicken. Normally, I would have filmed me eating the rest of that piece and probably one or two more pieces. But this video is already way too long. So I'm going to stop right here and finish off by saying I really, really, really hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Twice baked potatoes. That's right, we've taken something that was delicious, cooked just once, and cooked it a second time anyway. Why? Human nature. But nevertheless, if you're looking for a side dish for a special occasion dinner, this is very tasty, visually impressive, and really not that hard to do. So check it out. Step one, we're going to scrub and wash and dry four russet potatoes. You can obviously do as many as you want. And just like selecting a chef, short and fat is always better than long and skinny. Okay? So we have our four very stocky potatoes. We're going to put those on a baking sheet with a little bit of foil. I'm going to drizzle just a couple drops of vegetable oil on and give them a little massage. All right, you don't need too much, just enough to coat the outside. All right, once those are oiled, we're gonna go ahead and throw those in a preheated 400 degree oven for about an hour or until this happens. A parry knife will go in almost with no effort. You want these cooked all the way through, okay? You're gonna grab yourself a towel. You're gonna go around with a parry knife and cut off the top. I want you to go up about two thirds of the way. So just like you see me doing here, cut all the way around. You're gonna take that top off. You're gonna grab a spoon and you're gonna scoop out as much of the potato as you can without wrecking the outside. And because this is cooked all the way, that's not gonna be that hard to do. And you of course are also gonna scoop the potato from the top you cut off. And by the way, do not throw out that piece. We're gonna use that to make these extra visually impressive. So you're gonna scoop your still fairly hot potato into a bowl. And then we're gonna add stuff. Now please keep in mind, this video is a technique video, not a recipe. Not only do I want you not to follow my recipe exactly, I'm going to be a little bummed if you do. This is the kind of recipe that you really want to tailor to your personal tastes. All right, so we're going to scoop all that out into a bowl. And while it's still hot, I'm going to throw in some chunks of butter. And that's really not a lot. I could have used more. All right, I'm also going to throw in some finely minced green onions. And I'm just going to give that a quick stir, get that butter melting. Those green onions are going to kind of steam a little bit in that hot potato. And yes, I did switch from a spoon to a fork. Thank you for noticing. And then, of course, we're going to season it up with some freshly ground black pepper, a good amount of salt, and some cayenne pepper. At that point, I'm going to throw in a handful of white cheddar. All right, I think that works better color-wise than yellow cheddar, but same difference. 
And once the cheese is mixed in, the last two ingredients here, I'm going to make a little well. I'm going to pour in some cream and an egg yolk. And the reason I'm doing it this way is in case the potatoes are still too hot. I don't want to scramble the egg yolk. So doing it this way, we'll mix it in a little more gradually. And again, I'll keep reminding you, all these ingredients are optional. You do this any way you want. You can use milk, buttermilk. Basically, you could just simulate your favorite mashed potato recipe. You want to go with the bacon bits or more onion or different kinds of cheeses. You'd be crazy not to experiment. And of course, you're going to taste that. If that doesn't taste good, the twice-baked potatoes aren't going to taste good. That just makes sense. So make sure you taste that, especially for salt. And once you're happy with it, we're ready to fill the potatoes. And before we do, we're going to do one little quick trick that I invented back in 1981. We're going to take that top we cut off and place it in the bottom. That's going to add some extra height to this. And as anyone will tell you, people like things that are taller. That's why tall people make more money than short people. True story. And then you're going to divide your mixture among the four potatoes. And one of the things I love about this recipe, because of that extra slice of potato underneath and the extra stuff we mixed in, these are going to fill way up and it's going to look like you have more potato than you started with. Kind of a cool illusion. So anyway, divide that mixture up evenly between your potatoes. And at that point, we're going to take the tip of a fork and go around and mess up the surface. It might have got smoothed out as you were scooping the stuff into the potato, but we want as many nooks, crannies, and crevices as possible. That's what's going to give it a very, very cool look after we bake it the second time. All right, looks good. And then before they go back in the oven, we're going to paint the top with some melted butter, just a tiny bit as you can see here. And then last but not least, maybe a little bit of paprika on top for some extra color. Pop those back in the oven for about 20 minutes to a half hour until just spectacularly gorgeous. I mean, look at that. And you can see my fairly awesome looking roast pork in the background. So I'm pretty excited right now. And of course I have to taste this to make the video official after of course, touching the crusty buttery top. And then we're going in. Oh yeah, just incredible. So like I said, nothing wrong with regular baked potatoes, but this is just on a whole other level. I mean, why have a dud spud when you can have an uber tuber? By the way, you're welcome famous rappers looking for dope new rhymes. But anyway, if you're looking for a special occasion potato side dish for your next fancy meal, give these a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Falafel. That's right, falafel is one of those rare foods like french fries and pizza that pretty much everybody loves. In fact, when I meet someone that doesn't like falafel, I have to admit I'm a little suspicious. I mean, what's not to like about this crispy, deep fried chickpea fritter? And while I don't think there's much danger in this video, putting your friendly local neighborhood falafel stand out of business, this really did come out quite well, and I think you're gonna be surprised how easy it is. So let's go ahead and get started with the star of the show, garbanzo beans, also known as chickpeas, or as my family called them growing up, chichi beans. And for the amount I'm making, I'm gonna use one generous cup of dried garbanzo beans. And check them out, they have a very cool appearance. They look like little shriveled up, let's say brains. And what we need to do is soak these before we use them. So pro tip, if you want to make this today, make sure you do this step yesterday. All right, because what we need to do is cover these in cold water and let them soak at least overnight. Personally, I think 24 hours is better, but overnight should be fine. So like I said, we'll cover those with a few inches of cold water and we'll put that in a place where there's a pretty good chance it won't get knocked over. And as long as you've covered those with enough water, the next day they should look something like this. And then what we'll do at this point is drain those very, very well before we transfer that into our food processor and add the rest of the ingredients. All right, a blender will work sort of okay. And yes, you can make this by hand by crushing or chopping, but that's gonna take significantly longer. So try to find a food processor. I guarantee one of your married friends has one. Just borrow it for a day. Tell me you're gonna make it worth your while with falafel. But anyway, we're gonna go ahead and dump in our now very well drained beans, to which I'm gonna add some diced onion. And by the way, even though this is gonna get processed, I think it mixes more evenly if you start by cutting the onion nice and small first. So I'm gonna add in about half an onion, along with a whole bunch of minced garlic, we're also going to need a whole bunch of freshly chopped Italian parsley. Some people also like to use cilantro here, or a combination. We're also going to need some salt, as well as some freshly ground black pepper. We're also going to throw in a spoon of ground cumin, or cumin, as I believe it's supposed to be pronounced, as well as a little bit of ground coriander. And then we're going to shock the world by putting in a little pinch of cayenne, as well as a small touch of baking soda. No, not powder, baking soda, and a spoon of flour. Just a little, not too much. 
Okay, one of the big decisions with a falafel mix is do you want it more bready or more beany? And I prefer beany. So personally, I don't want to put too much flour here. And then last but not least, we're going to squeeze in a little bit of lemon juice. And that's pretty much it. And do you need to give it a mix like this before you process it? Probably not. I'm not sure why I did that, but it's too late now. But anyway, once all your ingredients are together, we're simply going to process this, pulsing on and off to start, of course. And what we want to end up with here is something that's pretty finely ground, but not a puree. All right, we don't want to liquefy this or turn it into a really fine paste. And with something like this, it's always a great idea about halfway through to take a little break, take off the lid, take a spatula, kind of scrape everything down off the sides, give it a little mix in case there are any large rogue chunks refusing to get mixed in. So I did that and recommend you do the same thing. And we'll continue to blitz that until, like I said, we have a very finely ground mixture. And instead of trying to think of a very clever way to describe it, let me just show you. This is what I think you want. All right, very finely ground, but not pasty. So we don't want to go too far, but it does have to be ground fine enough to hold a shape because we're going to form these into balls and or other shapes soon. So that's looking good. And at this point, we can transfer that to a bowl and kind of press it and pack it down. And then what we want to do is cover this and let it sit for an hour or two before we start forming our falafel. And yes, I have done these without letting it rest, and it does work. But by sticking it in the fridge for an hour or two, those flavors really are going to meld together. And it's going to be a little easier to work with, which is never a bad thing. So I did pop mine in the fridge for a couple hours, after which we're ready to shape. And I'm just going to make some small balls. I'm going to use one of these little sorbet scoops, which not only gives me the shape I want, but it also ensures these are about the same size each. And by the way, one tip, if you moisten your fingers, these are a lot easier to work with. In fact, there's an old saying in the falafel industry, damp hands make smooth balls. And it really is true. All right, so we're going to form our falafel into the shape of our choice. And at that point, they're ready to fry. So we're going to cook these in 350 degree oil for roughly five minutes. And of course, that time is going to vary with your size and shape. But for the ones I did here, five minutes was just about perfect. And I'm just playing with them here. You don't have to do this. I was just bored, so I gave them a stir. But like I said, we're going to cook those for about five minutes. At which point, they should look like this. Beautifully browned and crispy on the outside. Oh yeah, those look done. So we'll transfer those onto a rack to cool for a minute. And we'll take a bite so you can see that gorgeous inside. Look at that beautiful color. And right here, you can get a real good look at that texture inside. It shouldn't be too wet. It shouldn't be too dry. It should have the texture of falafel. And as you saw in our last video, I served these with some tahini sauce as a dip, which is just a very simple and very beautiful way to serve them. And I hear you out there. Those look amazing. But Chef John, I don't have a deep fryer. There's no way I could do these. Well, I got some great news. You don't need a deep fryer. Instead of making balls, just flatten them out into patties and pan fry them for a couple minutes per side. It works beautifully. And they really do come out just as gorgeous. And as you're about to hear, just as crispy. And not only does that technique work, but if you're gonna toss yours into a pita to make the traditional falafel sandwich, that shape actually works better. So I threw a couple in a pita, which I generously swipe with hummus, with some diced tomato, cucumber, and onion, and of course finished it with a drizzle of tahini. And that, my friends, for a sandwich that was not invented in America, is incredible. Just one of the all-time great fast foods of the world. And I know that's a concept that's hard for a lot of people to grasp, healthy, delicious, and beautiful fast food. But anyway, that's it. I'm gonna go finish the rest of that off. And I really hope this demo inspired you to give these a try. And what if it doesn't? I'm not gonna lie, I'll feel awful. You know, some of these puns just write themselves. But seriously, I really do hope you give these a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Cottage fries. That's right, the forgotten fry. Steak fries, home fries, french fries, they all get more publicity. But that's okay, the cottage fry is a fine fry in its own right, and one you could do quite nicely in an oven. So here we go. So we're going to start by slicing some potatoes in round slices about, well, a little more than a quarter inch, a little less than a half inch. I guess that would be three-eighths of an inch. Now I'm using Yukon Gold here. I normally use russet potatoes, which are a little starchier and probably a little better for this. But I had Yukon Gold on hand, so I decided to try them. And they do work fine. And as long as you wash these really well, there's no need to peel them. So I'm leaving the skin on. After they're sliced, I'm going to go ahead and rinse those in cold water. All right, we want to rinse off any excess starch. That's why the water gets all cloudy. You're going to rinse those, drain those, and dry them as best you can with some paper towels. All right, and those are prepped. I'm going to go ahead and drizzle over some olive oil. I'm going to go with some black pepper, All right, a little bit of cayenne, a generous amount of salt, 
And then a dried herb blend you've seen me use before, Herb de Provence, which is thyme, rosemary, oregano, marjoram, and usually a little bit of lavender, which are those little light purple buds you see in there. And no, I'm not measuring any of that. This is all to taste, okay? So don't be afraid. At that point, I'm going to go ahead and mix this up. Use what you want, but a bare hand really is the best tool here. Once those are evenly coated, I'm going to go ahead and place those on a baking sheet. Normally, I use foil, and they do come out a little crispier with foil. But in this case, I decided to go with my silicone mat because I hadn't tried it in a while on this, and I forgot if it worked or not. So I decided to go with it. I'm going to give them just a little bit of extra salt sprinkled on top. So we're going to place those down. We're going to space them evenly, and those are going to go in a hot oven. I want you to preheat it to 425, and we're going to pop those in for 15 minutes. Okay? And after 15 minutes, they're just going to start to fry in that oil. We're going to go ahead and flip those over, put them back in for another 15 minutes, and you're basically going to repeat this process until they're as browned and cooked as you want them. So this was after like a half hour. They're starting to get close, but I wasn't satisfied. So I popped those back in, another 15 minutes, and they were looking much closer. So I could have just put those in for a little bit more time, but I decided to go with an optional step here. If you have one of these cooling racks, one of these baking racks, transfer the potatoes on top, put that back in the oven like that. And because you're going to get that air circulation underneath, it really does help crisp these up. So I put those back in for about, I don't know, it was like 10 minutes maybe, 8, 10 minutes, something like that. And when they came out, I was finally happy. So like I said, that last step is optional. You can just leave them on the pan until they're as brown and crisp as you want. And there you go. Simple, easy, delicious cottage fries. If done properly, they should be kind of crispy and crunchy around the edge, yet still somewhat tender on the inside, okay? Think of it as like a fat, succulent potato chip, which, by the way, would be a great name for a band. And you can hear that. That's what they're supposed to sound like. And by the way, they're called cottage fries because they're supposed to resemble the shingles on the roof of a cottage. And by the way, if your home has a fried potato roof, I would love to see the rest of the house. And there you go. Who's not looking for another simple, easy to make, delicious potato side dish? I know I always am. So anyway, I really hope you give those a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Your first turkey. That's right, a completely technique-free turkey procedure for beginners and first-timers. And even though this procedure is pretty much technique-free and ultra-simple, it still guarantees you a magazine cover quality bird every time. So here we go. All right, I want you to take a large roasting pan or baking dish big enough to fit your turkey. And then the bottom, you're going to lay in one sliced up onion, one sliced up carrot, and one chopped up rib of celery. Just put it in the bottom. That's it. You're going to take your turkey and unwrap it, rinse it off. You see the paper towels? I want you to pat it nice and dry inside and out. Now, we're not going to mess around with any of the innards. This is just about roasting a turkey. So I cut off the tail. Sometimes that's cut off for you. It's just mostly fat. And then take out the bag of gizzards and the neck. And of course, don't throw that away. You can check out our video about making gravy. But this video is not about that. This is just about the bird. All right, step one here. I'm going to take my seasoning mix. That'll be on the blog post. Basically just salt and pepper. And we're going to generously season the inside cavity. Okay, I guess that's redundant. There's no outside cavities. All right, so you're going to season the inside, and then I'm really going to have to have you do this for sure. There is nothing more grotesque and disturbing in the culinary world than those burnt turkey wingtips sticking up in the air. God, I hate those. So please fold your wings underneath like this. It will look better. It will sit flatter, and I personally will feel a lot better. All right. So our turkey's pretty much ready for the final steps. I'm gonna have you melt a couple tablespoons of butter in a small saute pan. All right, use medium heat. And when the edges just start to turn golden, you see just a little color around the outside. Then you're gonna toss in a handful of sage and rosemary leaves. All right, once the herbs get tossed in, I want you to cook it in that hot butter for 60 seconds. No more, no less. So we're basically just making a quick and easy herb butter. All right, turn off the heat. And then with tongs, I want you just to fish out the herbs themselves. 
All right, they're whole, so they're easy to grab. And you're just going to stick that inside the cavity. And while the turkey roasts, that will kind of scent things from the inside out. All right, we're going to tie the legs together. Just take some butcher string, or you can always use dental floss. True story. All right, but just tie the legs together, just like that. Nothing fancy. All right, I'm on to my next step, which is my favorite, because I get to paint a turkey with butter. All right, come on. What part of that doesn't sound fun? So you're going to take that herb butter that we sizzled that sage and rosemary in, and we're going to paint the entire surface of the turkey, and that's really the secret to getting that amazing magazine cover look. All right, after that's covered, we're going to take our seasoning mix, our salt pepper mix, and we're going to season the outside very generously. All right, so pretty much any exposed surface should have some salt and pepper on it. All right, don't be afraid to turn it to get the sides and those little crevices. And once it's seasoned, your work is done. Pop it in a 325 degree oven and don't do anything to it. No basting, no foil, no pricking, no nothing. Just let it cook. A rule of thumb, about 15 minutes per pound approximately, but you can't go by that. Use a thermometer. I think mine is done when the middle of the thigh registers about 170 to 175 degrees, and that's it. Some books and websites are going to say 175 to 180. All right, up to you. I like it a little lower than that. So mine was about 13 and a half pounds. All right, and took about three and a half hours or so approximately. Now all those beautiful juices underneath the turkey, you're of course going to pour that into your gravy or make a gravy out of that. You can check out that video if you're not sure. Now you want to let that rest 15, 20 minutes at least. So that's perfect. You can bring all the rest of the stuff to the table, reheat your side dishes and so forth. And then listen to this. Oh yeah. All right, that beautiful brown skin, the meat still moist and tender. Now, I'm not saying it's bad to brine and smoke and fry and do all those other tricks. No problem. You can do that if you want. I'm not against all those fancy techniques. You just don't have to do them. And if you're just starting out, forget it. Just do this simple method. And then next year, maybe you try something a little more adventurous. I mean, come on, look at that. That is a magazine cover. You did that. I cannot believe you did that. Actually, I can totally believe you did that because it's easy. Anyway, I hope that helps. I hope you have a great holiday. Go to foodwishes.com for all the final details and more information as usual. And as always, enjoy. Macaroni salad. That's right, I cannot believe this many summers have come and gone, and I have not shared my take on this iconic summer side dish. I mean, I shudder to think what you've been using instead. No offense. So I apologize for the delay, but hopefully after you see and taste how awesome this comes out, all will be forgiven. So let's go ahead and get started with the dressing. And one of the keys to a great macaroni salad is to do the dressing first. For reasons I'll explain in a second. So we're going to start with some mayonnaise. And of course we're going to use real, full-fat mayonnaise. And to the mayonnaise, we'll add a couple spoons of Dijon mustard. To be honest, the yellow mustard seems to be more traditional, but I really do like the Dijon better here. So a little bit of mustard. And then we're also going to need some vinegar. And for this, I'm recommending plain white distilled vinegar. And it's not like you're going to wreck this using a different vinegar. But really, this is just in here for the acidity. And I think we want something that has a neutral flavor. And then we'll need to season this up a little bit with a shake of cayenne pepper, as well as some freshly ground black pepper, and of course, some salt. And we'll take a whisk and we'll mix that up. And that is basically the base of the dressing for this macaroni salad. Except for one key, crucial, and controversial ingredient, sugar. So while it is true that your classic American deli-style macaroni salad does use sort of a sweet dressing, I find that the most popular recipes out there call for way, way too much. Like a half a cup or two-thirds of a cup of sugar. So I'm only going to call for one or two tablespoons which I think provides plenty of sweetness, especially since we're gonna add lots of sweet vegetables. And once that's all mixed together, the liquid portion of our dressing's done, and we have to move on to the solids, also known as our diced veggies. So we'll start with a whole bunch of finely diced celery, as well as some grated carrot, and then we want a little bit of onion in this, and I'm gonna use the white and light green parts of some scallions, but just regular onion will work fine. And then for color, sweetness, and a little bitterness, we're definitely gonna do some pepper, and I'm gonna use several kinds. I'm gonna go with some red bell pepper, and then also some green pepper in the form of poblano and jalapeno. And then we'll take a spatula and we'll mix this up. And I really think it's important we do this step before we cook our pasta. 
okay? Because these vegetables are almost going to get like a quick pickling in this dressing. Okay, the salt, the sugar, the acid is going to pull liquid out of those vegetables. It's going to sort of firm up and crisp up the texture. And I really do think it makes a little bit of a difference. And besides, no one can really prove otherwise. And once that's mixed, we'll just pop that in the fridge while we prepare our macaroni. And I'm just going to leave that spatula right in there because we are going to use that to mix the salad up. So we'll pop that in the fridge and move on to our elbow macaroni. So what we have here is one pound of elbow macaroni. That's about four cups. And we are going to cook this in some generously salted boiling water. And I said cook, not undercook. We're going to cook this all the way, just like as if we were going to eat this hot. I don't have any idea who came up with the notion that you're supposed to undercook pasta for a salad. But it's just not true. Unless you want a horrible gummy texture macaroni salad. I mean, who knows? Maybe you do. But assuming you want an enjoyable texture, I recommend cooking it the full time. At which point we're going to drain that very, very well. So let's pour that into a colander to let it drain. And do not, under any circumstances, rinse this pasta. For this particular salad, that is the biggest mistake you could make. So don't do it. Just let this sit and drain for about five minutes. And every so often, I want you to give it the old shake a shake which is going to help knock off some of that water. And once we're convinced our macaroni is very, very well drained, we will transfer that into a large mixing bowl and proceed with probably the most important step of this whole process, the tossing and cooling of the macaroni. What we'll do is we'll take our spatula from the dressing and we'll use that to toss this macaroni occasionally until it cools down to just about room temp. And while we're using the spatula from the dressing, we're definitely not going to add any dressing until this has cooled down. All right, if you add a mayonnaise-based dressing to hot macaroni, what you'll end up with is a very greasy macaroni salad. And what's going to happen here is you're tossing and cooling. A very fine layer of starch is going to form on each one of those pieces of macaroni. And that thin layer of starch has been proven to more effectively grab on and hold on to that mayonnaise-based dressing. It's true. They've done studies. Where? The Mayo Clinic. But anyway, like I said, we want to cool that down to about room temperature. And if everything's gone according to plan, those pieces of macaroni should just be tacky enough to stick to your hand. So that's perfect right there. And yes, I will stop touching the macaroni now. And at this point, finally, we can go ahead and add our dressing. And as you're mixing this, if you're thinking, man, this is way too much dressing, seems kind of wet, don't worry. Because you prepped your macaroni properly, by the time this is ready to serve, it's going to be fully and perfectly absorbed. Trust me. And by the way, we're not going to taste it at this point. Okay, we don't want to season this until that macaroni has fully absorbed the dressing and it's at the temperature we're going to serve it. So what we'll do is we'll wrap it up and we'll pop it in the fridge for at least four hours, but overnight is best. Which is how long I left mine in the fridge. And then the next day when we pull it out, it should look something like this. And as predicted, all our dressing has been perfectly absorbed. And what I like to do at this point is take the spatula and give it a nice mix so we can really see what we have. And while you can definitely serve it like this, I generally like to freshen it up a little bit with another small spoon of mayonnaise and just a little touch of cold water. Just like a tablespoon or two, just drizzle it in and we'll give that a mix. And while that's really not going to significantly change the characteristics of the salad, it is, like I said, going to give it a little bit of a fresher look. So you decide. You are the Tony 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 of your macaroni. So that kind of stuff's up to you. And then once our salad has been tossed and freshened up, the last and most important step we have to taste for seasoning. So I gave mine a taste and it was perfect. And at that point, we'll transfer it into some kind of serving container. And by the way, because this salad is so naturally beautiful and fresh looking, it does not need any garnish. Unless, of course, you want people to share it on social media, which in that case, you better top it with some green onions. You think someone's going to pin this with no garnish on top? I don't think so. So I did a little green onion for the final touch. And that's it. My take on the classic all-American macaroni salad is done. And I realize taste is subjective. But for me, this is just the epitome of the classic American macaroni salad. Slightly but not too sweet, with just the right level of acidity and a very generous amount of vegetables, as well as a beautiful, silky, creamy mouthfeel because we didn't dress that macaroni hot. But anyway, that's it. My version of the classic American macaroni salad. And of course, this is going to pair beautifully with anything you barbecue, grill, or smoke this summer. I probably should have done that in a different order. But anyway, the point is, I really hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Pizza sauce. Yes, we've showed this before, but this is the new and improved version. And by new and improved, I mean old and secret. But anyway, I feel like you guys are ready for this now. And here is the top secret formula. 
So I'm going to start my prep here with a little bit of fresh oregano. Oregano is the signature herb of pizza sauce. So I have some fresh oregano. I'm going to pull the leaves off the stem. And once those are picked, I'm going to go ahead and chop that up. And that is ready to go. All right, in a saucepan, I got some olive oil, a good amount, and a good quality olive oil. I'm going to put that on medium low heat. And I'm going to throw in two anchovy fillets. That's right. There's anchovy in my pizza sauce. But not enough where people will be able to identify it. All right, so as soon as the anchovy starts sizzling like that, I'm going to throw in my minced garlic, very, very finely chopped garlic. And I'm just going to cook that for about 60 seconds. I do not want to brown the garlic. After we sizzle the garlic for about a minute, we're going to toss in our fresh oregano. At this point, we're going to turn the heat down as low as it goes. I'm going to stir in that oregano, and we're going to cook that in the oil for a couple minutes. I'm going to throw in some red chili flakes. I like my pizza sauce a little spicy. And then we're going to put in some dry oregano. Now, I know we got fresh, but we're also going to use dry because dry herbs and fresh herbs do not have the exact same flavor. All right, so depending on the recipe, sometimes we use one or the other. Here, we're going to use both. Okay, so at this point, we want to add our tomatoes, and we're using these. San Marzano tomatoes from Italy, the world's best sauce tomato, without a doubt, San Marzano. All right, make sure they're the real ones from Italy. Some will just say San Marzano style. They're actually from New Jersey. And don't get me wrong, I love New Jersey. I think they should actually make it like a real state. So while I love New Jersey, the San Marzano tomatoes from Italy, far superior. All right, to prep those, we're simply going to throw those in a bowl and use our bare hand to crush them. All right, keep crushing until you have a puree. And if you're thinking, ooh, he's touching the sauce with his bare hands. I don't want to eat that pizza. What do you think we're using to make the pizza dough with? That's right, our bare hands. So relax. All right, you have an immune system. Use it. All right, once the tomatoes are crushed, we're going to add that to our saucepan. If the heat's still on low, turn it up to medium. Give it a stir. And we're going to bring that up to a simmer. And while we wait for that to happen, we're going to add some seasoning, some salt, a little bit of sugar, and some black pepper. We're going to stir that in, and we're going to simmer this. Now, there's a big controversy on how long you should cook pizza sauce. Some people say not at all. It should be a raw sauce that just cooks on the pizza. Other people say you should simmer it for hours and hours. Me, I'm neutral, like a Swiss pizzeria. All right, I think you should cook it some, but it doesn't need to be cooked for hours. I simmer mine for about 35, 40 minutes, which I think is just about perfect. And by the way, sometimes we skim oil off the top of sauces. Not in this case. That olive oil is part of the sauce. So stir it right in. Do not skim it. Very important to the final product. Now, there's one last top secret trick that I learned from my grandparents where you take a very, very tiny pinch of baking soda and you stir that in. And what it does theoretically is that soda neutralizes some of the acid. So you can kind of see it foaming up there a little bit. And that's supposed to mellow out the sauce a little bit, make it a little less acidic, and also possibly prevent heartburn. Does it really work? Who knows and who cares? My grandma did it, so I do it. Okay? You're going to taste and adjust for seasoning, and then it's done. So easy, so incredibly delicious. So next time you're making homemade pizza with our homemade pizza dough recipe you might as well make some pizza sauce too. It's just a really, really tasty, all-purpose pizza sauce recipe. A little bit spicy, a little garlicky. We have that fresh oregano flavor and a little bit of the dry oregano flavor, which is a little deeper, a little smokier. All right, don't use too much, of course. Pizzas get ruined if there's too much sauce on it. Anyway, there you go. My top secret pizza sauce recipe finally revealed. I hope you give that a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more information as usual. And as always, enjoy. Potato pancakes. One of my favorite potato preparations. It's something I just don't make often enough. Super easy to make. Take two pounds, actually I had two and a quarter, two pounds of russet potatoes, peel them, and then grate them with a cheese grater into a bowl of very cold water. And I'm also going to grate in half an onion into the same bowl. And by the way, you've never cried until you've grated onion. It's, good. it's a good cry. All right, once that's done, I'm going to add some more water, fill it up a little more. And these are just going to sit in the cold water for about 20, 30 minutes. You don't need to rinse it. Just let them sit there. In the meantime, take a couple eggs, some flour, black pepper, a little pinch of cayenne, salt, of course. And we're going to whisk that up until very smooth and then set that aside. 
When our potatoes are ready, drain them, rinse them, put them in a colander and squeeze, 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 squeeze. All the water must be squeezed out. So I squeeze it a fistful at a time, and then I press it again with some paper towel. And make sure all the water is out of your potatoes. It's the only way to screw this up, is to have wet potatoes. Once the potatoes are as dry as humanly possible, add them to a bowl, mix in your egg mixture with a spatula, and that is a potato pancake mixture ready to fry. It's an incredibly easy recipe, I told you. I'm going to cover that while I make these, because you don't want any air to get to the potatoes, if possible, because they do oxidize. It's not something you could store, put away, and it, you know it's going to be good the next day. So you're going to want to make this stuff fresh. All right, now to fry these, we're going to use a heavy-duty skillet with a good amount of oil. They say a quarter inch of oil. I don't know if you quite need that much on the bottom, but you need enough oil to come up the side, at least halfway up the pancake, if you want a nice crispy cake. This one I'm just doing a little test to taste for salt. We're going to heat the pan on medium-high, and when it's hot, add your pancake mixture, flatten it out, this one's a little smaller than the ones you're going to see. But again, I'm just tasting for seasoning. I'm going to taste this. Oh man, so good. And it did need a little more seasoning. So what you want to do is you want to put your oil in the pan, heat it to medium high. When it starts to shimmer, add your potatoes, flatten them down a little bit. They don't have to be round. Who says they have to be round? If I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times. The kitchen is no place for a perfectionist. All right, flatten them down to about a half inch. Cook them for about, like I said, five minutes per side. You want to see the edges get really crispy and crunchy before you turn them. Five minutes on the other side. And when I flip them, normally I'll turn it down to medium. Because this is raw potato, you got to give it time to cook through. If you keep going on high heat or medium high the whole way, sometimes towards the end, the edges start getting a little too brown and the middle isn't quite tender enough. And there you go. I top mine with smoked salmon, sour cream, and dill. Very classic combination. You can do these with applesauce and sour cream. Another even more classic combination. Or just plain next to some eggs and bacon. Anyway, go to the site. The ingredients for the filling are quite important. So go check those out. And as always, enjoy it. Garlic shrimp. That's right, there's about 15,000 garlic shrimp recipes in the world. So there's no such thing as the garlic shrimp recipe, but this is my garlic shrimp recipe, and I think it's extremely delicious and I'd love to show you, so here is what we do. So this is one of those recipes you're gonna wanna get all your ingredients ready ahead of time. The foodies call that mise en place. Us regular folks, we call it prep, which is shorter and much less French. So we're gonna need a pound of shrimp, peeled and deveined, some fresh Italian parsley, freshly chopped, lots of garlic. If you use less than six cloves for a pound of shrimp, don't call it garlic shrimp. I also have some red pepper flakes and some lemon juice. And then the most top secret ingredient ever for garlic shrimp, the brine from a jar of capers. Oh, and by the way, quick tip, if you spill some on the table, just move the ramekin on top of it. It's like it never happened. Anyway, I'm gonna put about a tablespoon of caper brine in the lemon juice, and it's gonna give it that little secret something that will have your foodie friends talking behind your back, which is really the ultimate goal. And last but never least, we need some cold butter cut in four pieces. Okay, after the prep is done, we're gonna put our best, heaviest skillet on the highest heat you have. Crank that sucker up full blast. Into the pan, we're gonna add some olive oil, and we need to get this stuff hot, really hot. So highest heat, we want to make sure the bottom's coated. And we're going to stand there with shrimp in one hand, tongs in the other. And we're going to wait till we see the first wisps of smoke. And I know what you're thinking. I heard it's not healthy to let olive oil smoke. You're absolutely right. All right, but for this recipe, you need to. And it's okay. Don't let it start burning. But as soon as you see that first wisp of smoke, add the shrimp in, even them out, and then don't do anything. Just let them sizzle for a minute untouched. While they're sizzling, I want you to sprinkle them with salt. All right, we don't need any pepper because we have the red chili flakes. And after about a minute, I want you to toss them and basically do a little bit of a, I don't know, kind of like a stir fry type action for another minute. And at that point, the shrimp are not going to be cooked all the way through. All right, but they're going to be about halfway. So you're going to have a little bit of color on the outside, but the inside is still going to be sort of translucent. And when they look like that, I'm going to go ahead and add my garlic and my chili flakes. And we're going to stir that in and cook the garlic. Now this is only going to take about a minute. We're going to really keep it moving. We're not going to let the garlic brown at all. And since this is only going for like a minute, that shouldn't be a problem. So just keep kind of tossing it, stirring it, tossing it, stirring it. And after one minute, it's going to look something like that. We're going to go ahead and quickly dump in the lemon juice, 
caper brine mixture, one of the four chunks of butter, and half our parsley, okay? We're gonna save the other half to put on top fresh. All right, we're gonna stir all that together. I'm gonna switch to a big spoon here. And as soon as I see that first piece of butter is melted, I'm turning the heat down to low. We're gonna to toss in the rest of the butter. And when that's melted, you are ready to eat some unbelievably delicious garlic shrimp. All right, you're gonna taste and adjust for seasoning. I didn't even need to tell you that, but I had like six seconds to kill. All right, and this is fantastic on any kind of starch, pasta, rice, potatoes, etc. but I like it on toast. So I had some Meyer lemon bread. How good does that sound? Some Meyer lemon bread that I toasted. I topped it with my garlic shrimp, and then it's time for that amazing sauce. Now mine got a little thick as I was portioning my shrimp out, so no worries. Put a little splash of water until that sauce texture is just to your liking. All right, if you need to blast it with a couple seconds of heat, go ahead. You're gonna spoon over the sauce. Oh yeah, unreal. I hate when chefs say, I wish you could smell this, but you know what? That's right. I wish you could smell this. You're definitely gonna to wanna to top with some fresh parsley. That's why we save so much. So be generous with that. And there you go. Garlic shrimp. So incredibly simple, just sweet shrimp. That big punch of garlic right in your face. The acid from the lemon, the herbaceous parsley. Just a classic, classic combination. And one I think you're gonna have a very hard time not making after watching this video perfect for a quick weeknight dinner or, that's right, a fancy occasion. It's just one of those dishes that works anytime, any place. People love it. As long as you have your stuff prepped ahead of time, super easy recipe. Anyway, I hope you give that a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more information as usual. And as always, enjoy. prime rib method used to be called method x now it's called the food wish method and it produces prime ribs so perfectly pink and delicious using math all right but don't be scared it's easy math now for this easy math to work our prime rib must not be cold must be left out at room temperature for at least at least six hours all right longer is better if you put the prime rib in cold the math doesn't work also, we want to make sure we're using a bone-in prime rib. You see there? All right, I have two rib bones, which, by the way, means this is enough for four people. Two people per bone. All right, so we have our rib. It's room temperature. Next step, we need a flavored butter, which is really simple. Soft butter, black pepper, freshly ground, of course, and herb de Provence. That is a really cool Mediterranean herb mix. You can read about that on the blog. It has rosemary, thyme, usual suspects. It also has a little bit of lavender, which is very interesting. Okay, we're gonna mix that up and spread it over our room temperature prime rib. And I will keep saying room temperature because it's so important. By the way, there's an old saying in the video recipe business, if you spread butter on it, they will watch. So there you go. All right, so once that's covered with butter, which by the way is only there, well, it's there for flavor, but it's mostly there to make this salt stick. So we're gonna take a whole bunch of kosher salt and we're gonna sprinkle that over all the surface area, especially on top. This is a giant piece of meat, so only a tiny fraction of this salt is actually gonna end up on your plate, but it is important. I heard Iron Chef Michael Simon once say, use twice as much as you think you need, which is, you know, probably a, a pretty safe bet. All right, so our room temperature prime rib is buttered. It's seasoned, and now we have to preheat the oven to 500 degrees. And by the way, on the blog, you can read about which ovens will work and which won't. Yes, electric do work, gas, of course, but you have to have a good oven that has an accurate temperature gauge, or this is not going to work. All right, on to the math. In your calculator, punch in the exact weight from the label of your prime rib. Mine was 5 pounds, 0.35. Multiply that by five minutes, and you will get your cooking time at 500. You're going to round up to the nearest minute, which for me is 27. The prime rib goes in the middle of the oven and cooks at 500 for exactly that many minutes. So I'm going to count down from 27 minutes down to zero. By the way, I like to wait a minute before I set the timer to counteract the heat loss from putting the pan in the oven. So again, the weight of your prime rib times five, it's going to cook that many minutes at 500 degrees. And then when your timer rings, turn off the oven. Do not open the door. Do not touch the door handle. In fact, don't even look at the oven. Just turn off the heat and set your timer for exactly two hours. 
And what's going to happen, that surface has been seared at 500 degrees and there's a lot of heat in that oven and it's going to slowly, over the next two hours, it's going to slowly cook through the rest of the meat to a perfect pink doneness. It's in some kind of magical sweet spot between rare and medium rare where I personally think prime rib should be eaten. Man, that looks great. I can't wait to dig in. Now, one thing you don't have to worry about here is letting it rest. It's rested for two hours. Just slice it up and serve. It will still be warm inside. Now, to make things easier, I like to cut the bones off the bottom before I slice. If you want to serve it with the bone on, go ahead. But since I'm going to try to serve four people out of this, I'm going to cut the bones off, which is super simple. Just take a knife and go along where the bone meets the meat, and that will come off quite easily. Just keep your knife right along the edge of the bone, and you're good. And of course, do not discard those. You can throw some barbecue sauce on those, put them in the oven till fork tender, and you can totally get your, you know, Fred Flintstone on. Now, I told you, this magical mathematical method produces the most gorgeous pink prime rib you'll ever see. But who are you going to believe, me or your eyes? Check it out. Oh my God. Is that just the most beautiful thing you've ever seen? Oh, and by the way, yes, this is my piece, so it's okay that I'm, you know, touching it so much. But I can't help myself. It feels so good. The amount of moisture left in this meat is stunning. It is pink like medium rare, but the texture, the moisture is closer to a rare. It's just amazing. I mean, you can see there with the light from the window coming in, how it's glistening. Now, because this is just warm, make sure you use heated plates. All right, you want warm plates. You want to make sure your au jus is very hot, boiling hot. You see that there in the ramekin. I will demo that in another video very soon. And there you go. Beautiful, classic, perfectly pink prime rib using the Food Wish method. I hope you give that a try. If you like your prime rib cooked like this, this is the best method. I hope you give it a try. All the ingredients are on the site, plus a ton more information. So go check it out. And as always, enjoy. The French omelette. That's right, you might not think you need a video for how to make an omelette, but unless you've already somehow mastered this magical technique, I really think you do. And it won't be until you make one of these and try it yourself when you'll realize just how badly you needed to know how to do this. Since quite simply put, it's unlike any other omelette experience. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. And as you may have heard, to make an omelet, you gotta break a few eggs. Three large ones to be exact. And of course, farm fresh, or at least the freshest, highest quality eggs you can manage. Please do not buy your eggs at the same place you buy your motor oil. And then to our three large eggs, the only other things we're gonna add are a pinch of salt and a few drops of cold water, like a half a teaspoon. And other than a ridiculous amount of butter, that's gonna be it for our ingredients. And then what we'll do at this point is grab a whisk and bust those eggs right in the yolks. And we're gonna whisk those for a minute or two or until they turn sort of liquidy. All right, when you first start whisking, they're gonna be kind of thick and viscous. But you'll see after about a minute or so, the mixture's gonna kind of thin out. And you know you're done when the eggs drip off the whisk like this. Okay, so we wanna make sure our eggs are well beaten. We want no visible egg whites at all. So those are looking good. And once that's been accomplished, we'll simply set that aside and head to the stove to prep our pan. And ideally, we're going to use about a 9 or 10 inch nonstick, which we will place over medium high heat and melt a tablespoon of butter. Except when a French chef is making an omelet and they tell you to put a tablespoon of butter in, they always mean more like two tablespoons. And what we'll do is let that melt over medium high heat as we stand by armed with hopefully a large, flexible rubber spatula. One that's heat proof, of course. And what we'll do as soon as that butter's melted, but before it starts to sizzle, we will go ahead and quickly pour in our eggs. At which point we'll begin a three-stage process, which is the scrambling, the spreading, and the folding. So we'll dump our eggs in, and we'll start working them over with a circular motion with our spatula. And in culinary school, they taught us to do this in a figure eight, but I never did master that, and I found it splashed eggs up the side of the pan. So I prefer using more of the circular motion you see here, while at the same time sort of shaking the pan. And if you'll notice, since these eggs are still very loose, when I shake the pan, it kind of levels them out. Well, basically, we're going to continue this scrambling stage until that stops happening. Okay, when our eggs start firming up enough where we can't really do that, and we sort of have to spread with the spatula to even them out, which is sort of where we're at right now, what we want to do is turn our heat down to low, and we will go from scrambling to spreading. And all we're doing is sort of moving around the runny eggs to less runny spots. And what we'll do is continue spreading that mixture around on low until our surface is wet but not runny, which is what I have right here. 
Okay, so we don't have pools of runny egg, but the surface is still very wet, very moist. And once it reaches this point, what we'll do is turn off our heat and fold it up. So we'll start at the handle and roll perpendicularly to the other side, but not all the way. We want to stop a couple inches away from the edge, because what we'll do is use our spatula to fold that edge towards the middle, so that we somehow, someway end up with the seam on the top. And because these eggs are nice and soft and custardy, they're very easy to shape. And then at this point, you might think we're ready to serve, but we're not. What we're going to do is toss in a couple small chunks of butter. Not necessarily as much as I just did, but a few chunks. And what we'll do is let that melt and kind of push that under the omelet to lubricate it. Or at least that's what the French chefs say. They say it's going to be easier to get the omelet out of the pan if we do this. But I don't think that's the real reason. I really think it's because they want us to add more butter. Plus, I think the texture of your omelet's going to be better if this sits for a minute in the pan. But anyway, we're going to toss in a little extra butter and kind of spread it over and push it underneath. And what we'll do once that's melted is sort of push our omelet to the edge of the pan, at which point we can carefully flop it over onto a plate, making sure the seam side goes down. Because the ultimate goal of a French omelet is a perfectly smooth, glistening surface. And of course, once it's on the plate, you can shape it any way you want. Some people like to leave the ends open, but I like to sort of taper them. Although maybe after this, I will reconsider that. But anyway, we're going to plate our omelet, and finally it's time to eat. Just as soon as we add some more butter. No, I'm not kidding. The last official step for any real French omelet is to brush or spread a little bit of butter on the top to sort of give that surface a beautiful shine. But once that's done, finally we can eat. With a little bit of watercress, and of course some toasted bread. And I was just about to say I could have made that a lot nicer if I wasn't filming it. But you know what, that's not actually true. This is probably one of the better French omelets I've ever made. Which reminds me, who cares what it looks like? As people in the know know, the true beauty of a French omelet lies within. So let me go ahead and cut in, so you can see what I'm talking about. And no, I usually don't need a fork and knife for my omelet, but I wanted to get a nice clean cut, so you would be able to see this. Because of our three stages of scrambling, spreading, and the folding, we basically created layers and layers of beautiful custardy eggs. This is like an entirely different food than your typical overcooked, golden brown, dry American omelet. I mean, look at that. It's just so insanely creamy and delicious. And by the way, if you want to add some of your favorite fillings before you fold this up, go ahead. I mean, you are the Suzanne Plachette of your French omelette. But if you've never made one of these before, I highly suggest you make it as shown. Just so you can taste the magic that is the pure and true French omelette. But of course, a little bit of cayenne never hurt. Sorry, I couldn't resist. But anyway, that's it. My method for doing French omelettes. Which, by the way, is the only omelette we're allowed to have wine with at breakfast. Like maybe a nice cold glass of Sauvignon Blanc. And I'm not sure if that's the best pairing, but I do know how to pronounce it. But anyway, whether you're going to make this to impress someone at some fancy breakfast, or you just can't figure out what to eat on some rainy weeknight, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Buttermilk fried chicken. One of my favorite recipes of all time, and not that hard to put together. And uh, just for fun, I'm going to show you how I break down a whole chicken for fried chicken. I'm going to take off the wing tips. Those are useless. I'm going to dejoint the wings right where they attach to the body. All right, the thigh leg section comes off. Don't be afraid to snap and dislocate. And then that gets cut between the drumstick and the thigh. Yes, this is quick, but go back and watch it, you know, seven or eight times. You'll see. So once the legs and thighs are done, I'm left with basically the carcass, which has the backbone and the breast. And you'll notice I'm using a nice heavy cleaver, the ultimate tool for a chicken breakdown. Snap the backbone like that, cut the breast in half, and then each breast gets cut in two pieces. All right, and you'll notice here when I cut the breast in half, I slice down till I hit the bone and then I give it one pound with my hand so it goes through in one shot nice and clean. Otherwise you get like bone fragments. So there's my four breast pieces, my two thighs, drumsticks, and the two wings. All right, into the bowl it goes. Black pepper, salt, paprika, dried herbs, white pepper, cayenne, and that gets tossed. All the, believe it or not, 11 herbs and spices will be on this site. Okay, after that's well tossed with the spices and herbs, you're going to top it with buttermilk, and we're going to let that sit for six hours. You can get away with four. You can go overnight if you want, but I like six hours. All right, then we're going to make some seasoned flour, which is just flour, salt, some paprika, some cayenne, some garlic powder, some white pepper, 
and some onion powder. So give that a mix. After the buttermilk marination, the chicken pieces get dredged. Oh my god, there's a fire truck going by. Hate when that happens. The chicken gets dredged in that seasoned flour well. There, you want it really nicely coated. Give it a little shake off, put it on a plate, and then we're ready to fry. And what we're gonna do, and there's lots of different ways to fry this. I'm gonna take a Dutch oven. All right, that's a big eight quart Dutch oven. And I have about two and a half quarts of oil in there. And I'm gonna fry all eight pieces at once. Now, some people like to fry in a skillet in just like an inch or two of oil, and then they do it in batches and they turn it halfway through. You know, I don't have the patience. I want it to all be done at the same time. Of course, this uses twice the oil, but you know what? How often do you make fried chicken? Like once a year? So at 350, I'm gonna cook that for about 10 minutes. It's gonna develop a nice crust. I'm gonna go in after 10 minutes and just move it around a little, just in case some pieces are stuck together. I want to cook evenly. That's gonna go for about another 10 to 15 minutes. So it's about 20, 25 minutes total in the hot oil to cook all the way through. Now, while that's finishing up, I like to take a rack and put it on some paper towels on a sheet pan. And that's what I'm gonna to use to drain the cooked chicken on. All right, so that's ready. And the chicken's ready. Look at that, unbelievably beautiful. So again, that's been about 20 to 25 minutes total in the oil. I'm gonna fish it out with my spider, that little strainer thing you see there. And what beautiful chicken. Impossibly crispy, amazingly delicious. Don't bite into it for about 10 minutes because it's so hot, you won't enjoy it. You'll just burn yourself. So 10 minutes later, we had a delicious plate of fried chicken and I just could not bring myself to eat this in front of you. But trust me, it was every bit as good as it looks. That is not a hard recipe. It does take a little bit of work, but completely worth it. So like I said, 11 herbs and spices, believe it or not, are what was included in this. You can go to the site, count them yourself, because all the ingredients are listed there. And as always, enjoy. These are the most incredible onion rings ever. You know I'm normally pretty modest and humble. It's one of the things that makes me so awesome. But I have to say, these are incredible, best in the world. All right, so we're gonna start with some regular flour and cornstarch. So it's kind of similar to a tempura batter, basically. But there's my secret ingredient, instant mashed potatoes. Believe it. All right, little cayenne. So I'm gonna whisk up the dry ingredients, and then I'm gonna add club soda. You have to get the exact amounts on Food Wishes. We're gonna stir that in, which is just gonna take a minute. By the way, don't worry about developing gluten or the batter's gonna be tough. It's not, this is unbelievable. Now it looks pretty thin there, but as it sits, the instant mashed potato, even though it's just a little bit, is gonna swell up and absorb some of that liquid. It's gonna be perfect. All right, we're gonna put some panko breadcrumbs, the other secret, in a shallow pan. You can get those in any store. Stop emailing me. You can't find panko. You can. Big supermarkets have it. All right, I like to use not super big, but kind of medium yellow onions. Do not cut them any thicker than a quarter inch, otherwise they won't cook. Separate them into rings. I didn't really need to tell you that, right? All right, so there we go. This is only like 10 minutes later. Our batter has thickened slightly, and it's perfect. We're gonna dump in a few rings at a time. Make sure they get coated with the batter, which is pretty much gonna drip off, but enough's gonna stick on there to latch onto these panko breadcrumbs, these sharp, incredibly crispy breadcrumbs. By the way, do as I say, not as you just saw me do. Use a separate fork for the crumbs and a separate fork to pull them out of the batter. Much easier. All right, we're gonna fry these and I'm not doing a deep fry demo, just standard 350. I'm using olive oil, but any standard vegetable oil, frying oil is gonna work. It's gonna go maybe three, two and a half, three minutes. And when it comes out, that magic formula that I've come up with, with the potato and the panko, produces the most crispiest onion ring I've ever had, ever, anywhere. All right, now you can hear this. That's not fake sounds. That is the actual crunchiness. And now you just have to listen to this. I mean, come on, unbelievable. All right, that was really bland because there was no salt. Make sure you salt these generously before serving with some very fine sea salt so it sticks on there. And let me finish this. I know this is so rude, but come on, admit it. You want to hear it. And that's it. Super crispy, amazing onion rings. 
And here's really the ultimate test. Lots of different recipes are crunchy right when they come out of the oil, okay? The real test, does it stay crunchy? What you're gonna see in here now is literally to the second, 15 minutes later. These sat on this rack for 15 minutes and this is what they sound like. Your Honor, I rest my case. Anyway, I hope you give it a try. Go to the site, all the ingredients are there. And as always, enjoy. Fondant potatoes. That's right, if your grandfather was a European aristocrat, this may have been one of his favorite potato side dishes. So basically what I'm trying to say is this is a very old school recipe, much more popular in England and Europe, probably because it has more than one step. Americans have never really embraced it, but I really do think it's a cool recipe and you can never have enough potato recipes, okay? So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take some russet potatoes. You have to use the russet. That's just the texture that works best here. Try to get them as uniformly shaped as possible because what we're going for is perfect cylinders. All right, we're gonna cut off both ends because the next step after we cut the ends off is to turn it up on its side and slice down with your knife, peeling it and giving it some cool edges. All right, so you could just peel this, but this is the traditional method. And of course the potatoes are gonna vary slightly. So as you're doing this step, you're gonna try to get them approximately all the same thickness. When you get down to the bottom, just feel free to clean it up like that. And then once those are peeled, you're gonna turn those on their side and we're gonna cut them in half as even as you can. All right, that's pretty good. Close enough for YouTube. We're gonna throw those in a bowl of cold water and let them sit for about five minutes just to remove some of the starch from the outside, at which point we'll transfer those onto a paper towel to pat them dry. All right, we don't want any water on the surface when these go in the pan. And once our potatoes are completely dry, we're gonna go over to a heavy bottom skillet. I'm using a cast iron one. I'm gonna set that over high heat. I'm gonna put in a couple tablespoons of grapeseed oil or some other high smoke point oil. Canola would work. I think you'd be okay with any vegetable oil. When the oil is very hot and shimmering, we're gonna add our potatoes. You wanna put your best looking side down. It doesn't really matter, but if one side's a little flatter and better looking than another, put that side down first. At that point, you can lower your heat to medium high. And we're just gonna let those sit in there for about five or six minutes until they brown very nicely. While you're waiting, you can generously salt and pepper those. And I don't know exactly how long my first side took to brown. I don't time this kind of stuff. I just go by eye. And we're not talking barely golden. We're talking fairly well browned. All right, so be patient. So that wasn't ready yet. So I let them go another couple minutes. And that's more like it. So when they look like that, you can go ahead and flip those over. And at that point, that vegetable oil has served its purpose. I'm gonna take a paper towel and absorb that oil because we're gonna replace it with butter. That's right, always an upgrade. So we're gonna throw in a knob of butter with some thyme sprigs. And if you're not sure what a knob of butter is, you can just ask one of your British friends, they know. And again, we're still on medium high heat and we're gonna swish that around the pan. That butter's gonna get infused with that thyme. And you wanna spoon and or paint with the thyme sprigs over the top. And what we're looking for here is that butter foam at the top to turn from white to a light tan color. It's gonna take a couple minutes. All right, while we're waiting, let's go ahead and season this side with a generous amount of salt and pepper. And of course, it's always a good idea to make sure your potatoes are evenly spaced. And as soon as that butter foam just starts to think about turning golden, I want you to dump in a half a cup of chicken stock because these potatoes are gonna roast in that stock to finish cooking in the oven. And by the way, all fondant potato means is potatoes that are roasted with stock, or at least that's what they told me in culinary school. And why would they just make that up? So we're gonna dump in the stock and immediately place that in a preheated 425 degree oven for about 30 minutes or until your fondant potatoes look like this. They're gonna be very, very tender and creamy inside. And of course the edges will be browned and crusty. The bottom gets nice and sticky from the stock, which imparts a little bit of extra richness into the potato. And of course, if yours aren't cooked yet and your stock's gone and you're worrying about the bottom burning, just add another splash and let it cook a little longer. All right, that's you cooking. I just get you close. You gotta figure out the rest. And then to finish, of course, we're gonna transfer this onto some kind of serving platter. If I was you, I would totally spoon over a little bit of that thyme butter. And because I have a garden, I'm gonna put some blossoming thyme flowers around. I like my food pretty. And then please do as I say, not as I'm about to do right now. To really appreciate these, you have to let them cool down a little bit. This is way too hot to bite into, but I'm gonna do it anyway. I got a video to shoot. And if you've never had these before, you're gonna be amazed at that texture. So dense and moist and rich, just really, really cool. Of course, you have that butter and thyme. That's always a good thing when you're talking potatoes. 
And of course, the real magic is that contrast between those crusty edges. Let's just listen for a little bit. Oh yeah. So it's those crusty edges contrasted with that creamy, moist center. It really is a tremendous potato technique. And of course, I've always wished there wasn't a dish already called scalloped potatoes, because I would call this scallop potatoes, because it looks like a giant scallop. But because there is, we can't do it. It would be too confusing. Hey, I ordered the scallop potato, not the scallop potatoes. So obviously that wouldn't work. There'd be like a whole scene. So we call them fondant potatoes. It's a fine name, all right? So I really hope you give that a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info, as usual. And as always, enjoy. Today I'm going to show you spaghetti aglio olio, which is the most popular pasta dish in Italy by far. And all spaghetti aglio olio means is spaghetti with garlic and oil. So we're going to start by slicing thin six cloves of garlic. Now we're not mincing, we're not chopping, we want to slice it just like that. Very specific cut for this dish. And there's my prepped garlic. I'm also going to chop about a quarter cup of fresh Italian parsley. And then the other ingredients are really good olive oil and a really good... Reggiano, Parmesan, the real stuff. We're going to add our olive oil and our garlic to a cold saute pan. Turn the heat to medium, and we're going to slowly toast that garlic. Now, the beauty of this dish is while the garlic's toasting, we're going to cook the pasta. The sauce and the pasta take about the same amount of time. So make sure you're doing these two things right next to each other. So our pasta is boiling. Our garlic is in the pan. As soon as it starts to bubble, turn the heat down to medium-low, and then we're just going to watch this slowly toast. Okay, don't walk away. This is only going to take about five minutes. The garlic should just be barely bubbling like that. And we want to slowly, slowly toast that to a beautiful golden brown. So basically what we're trying to do is infuse as much of that toasted garlic flavor into the olive oil without getting it too dark or bitter. See that? That's just about where you want to be. Okay, as soon as that gets to that stage, we're going to quickly turn off the heat and add a half a ladle, about a half a cup of our boiling pasta water. And even though we turned off the heat, you need that water in there to stop the browning process because that's perfect right there. And by now, our pasta is cooked and we're going to drain our spaghetti. We're not going to rinse our spaghetti. Do not rinse your spaghetti. Never rinse your spaghetti. Please do not rinse your spaghetti. All right, we're going to dump that into our pasta bowl. We're going to add some black pepper, red pepper flakes, and salt to taste. At that point, we're going to pour over that unbelievable garlic oil. If you could smell this, you'd be like, man, that smells good, or something to that effect. And there you can see all our slices of garlic. So while there's a ton of garlic in this, it's actually pretty mild because of how we slowly toasted that in the oil. Okay, so don't be afraid. All right, we're going to dump over about two-thirds of the cheese. Of course, all the amounts will be on food wishes, as always. We're going to dump over our Italian parsley, and then we're going to toss and serve. So after it's all mixed up really well, I'm going to bring it to the table, topped with the rest of the cheese, and that's it. Classic, or at least what I think is classic, spaghetti aglioia, spaghetti with garlic and oil. Ironically, had I shot this video before I got the cold that caused the laryngitis, I wouldn't have the laryngitis, because as you know, garlic is like a superfood that prevents almost everything. So not only does this taste fantastic, it's just really, really good for you, body, mind, and spirit. So I hope you give this a try. Once again, I apologize for the voice, but like I said, the show must go on. All the ingredients are on the site, so go check it out. And as always, enjoy. That's right, I'm finally making lasagna. It's been requested so many times, and because it's such a popular Italian-American holiday tradition, I thought this would be the perfect time to do it. So for me, there are two keys to a great lasagna, a fantastic meat sauce, and a great cheese filling. So first things first. So for the meat sauce, I'm gonna take some Italian sausage and ground beef. We're gonna put that over medium heat, and while it's browning, we're gonna break it up into as small a pieces as possible. While that's browning, I'm gonna take some mushrooms and give them a really rough chop. Okay, don't worry about them all being the same size. Those are gonna break down in the sauce anyway. So I'm gonna add those to my browning meat. All right, go ahead and stir those in. I'm also gonna add some salt, some black pepper, and some red chili flakes. Okay, so at this point, I want you to turn the heat to medium high and cook it until the meat's browned and any liquid that came out of the mushrooms has evaporated. 
So you see this, the meat's brown and the bottom of the pan is pretty much dry. And at that point, we're gonna add our prepared marinara sauce. Am I using homemade? Well, I'm not at liberty to say. But you can use just about anything here. Homemade, jarred sauce, as long as it's good quality, not a problem, all right? You saw me add a splash of water there. If you're using jarred sauce, make sure you rinse the jars with water. And then we're gonna bring that to a simmer, turn it down to low, and simmer for hours. How long exactly? I don't know. It should simmer until the meat is extremely, extremely tender. All right, I did mine about two hours. You wanna make sure you add a little more water along the way if it's getting too thick. And once it's done and you're happy with the texture, turn it off, taste for salt and pepper, and set it aside. All right, so that's half the battle. Our beautiful meat sauce is ready. On to the cheese filling, which is simply a couple beaten eggs, some ricotta cheese, and not that skim milk stuff, the real whole milk variety. For this recipe, you just need the highest quality cheeses possible. Will people know? I don't care. I will know, and you will know. So after that, we're gonna add our Reggiano Parmesan and fresh mozzarella. Now you notice how it's diced and not grated? You shouldn't be able to grate good, soft, fresh mozzarella. In fact, there's an old saying, if you can use a grater, you should be a hater. All right, so use that nice, fresh, soft mozzarella. They have it in stores now, use it. We're also gonna add some salt and pepper and cayenne. And then last but not least, some fresh Italian parsley and give that a good mix. So like I said earlier, if you have a great meat sauce and a really great cheese filling, you are going to have a fantastic lasagna. There's no way not to. So before we can assemble this, of course we have to boil one box, one pound lasagna noodles. All right, make sure you're using salted water. Now this is the only time ever, except for maybe pasta salad, where I'm gonna tell you when the pasta's cooked, drain it, rinse it, and keep it in cold water. All right, so you see that here? My noodles are ready, and it's time for final assembly. And yes, in case you're wondering, I have tried using the raw noodles, not boiling them first. I don't like that method. All right, let's talk about the pan. This is not something that goes in your wimpy little 9 by 13 casserole dish. This needs a lasagna pan. 10 by 15 by like 3 inches deep is perfect. All right, so get yourself a nice lasagna pan. Now, assembly is super easy if you can do some simple math. Divide your sauce into four parts your noodles into three parts, and your cheese into two parts. So one-fourth of the sauce goes down. On top of that, one-third of the noodles. All right, I had 18 noodles, so I used six. Okay, so once the first third of the noodles are down, the base of our lasagna is done, and we're ready for the first half of the cheese mixture. All right, so divide that perfectly in half, spread that cheese mixture out onto the noodles, and then top with another portion of the meat sauce. All right, so once that's spread nice and even, we are gonna take the second third of our noodles, place those over, and as long as it's covered, you're good. Don't worry about what it looks like. Don't worry if you got a couple broken ones. It's all good when it bakes. So the second layer of noodles are down. The last of the cheese mixture gets spread on there. I don't know about you, but I'm getting kind of excited. On top of the cheese, just like our last layer, goes the meat sauce. At this point, we're gonna give it a little shake to settle it. And yes, the old tapa tapa. And to finish this beauty off, the last of the noodles go over the top. You can see the end there. I just pieced together some of the smaller broken pieces. Doesn't matter, relax. Once this cooks, it all looks fantastic. All right, over that goes the last fourth of the meat sauce. Spread that over, make sure all the noodles are covered. I'm gonna dot that with more fresh mozzarella. We're gonna finish with some more grated Parmesan cheese. Cover it loosely with foil. I don't want the foil touching the cheese, but I do want it covered. I'm gonna put it on a sheet pan in case I have any spillover. I'm gonna put that in a 375 degree oven for 30 minutes. At that point, take off the foil, continue cooking for about another 30, 35 minutes until it's done. And when it's done, it will be golden brown, it will be bubbling, and it will be hot all the way through. What a gorgeous, gorgeous lasagna, if I do say so myself. And I know you can't wait to tear into this, but let it sit for at least 20 minutes. It's just gonna to be too hot to enjoy unless you do, all right? But after that, all bets are off. Cut it into nice squares. You'll get like 12 decent portions out of this or like nine huge ones. You can see all those beautiful layers, that super meaty sauce with the sausage and the beef and the mushrooms adding a little bit of extra something, the beautiful cheeses, so, so delicious. So whether you're serving this for your Italian American Christmas dinner or just any time, I hope you give this recipe a try. 
So go to the site, all the ingredients are there for the sauce, for the filling, for the whole thing. And as always, enjoy. Pita bread. That's right, by popular demand, this is the pita bread that you saw in the tzatziki video. And unlike lots of other baked products, which are quite frankly better from a bakery, I mean, remember the time you tried to make croissants? Ouch. But this, on the other hand, is so far superior homemade than the stuff you get at the grocery store, it's not even close. And in addition to being delicious to eat, it's also extremely easy to make. So we're going to start by putting one package of yeast in the bowl of our stand mixer. To that, I'm going to add one cup of very warm but not too hot water, and then one cup of flour, and we're going to give that a good mix. And I'm going to let that sit there for about 15 or 20 minutes. So basically, we're doing kind of a very quick sponge here, but mostly we're just making sure that our yeast is active. And 15 minutes later, if you see it bubbling like this, you know you're good to go. It'll start getting a little foamy, kind of like the head of a beer, although that's not a very good analogy. But you know what? I just like comparing things to beer. But anyway, when you see those little bubbles, that means your yeast is active and you're ready for the next step. So at that point, we're going to go ahead and dump in some olive oil and some salt. By the way, this dough is actually very similar to our pizza dough recipe. So go ahead and mix in the olive oil and the salt. And then we're going to add the rest of the flour, but not quite all of it. All right, this is going to take about two more cups of flour, but I don't like to add it all at once. A supple, moist, sticky dough is very important here. So I'll add like three quarters of the rest of the flour. Of course, we're going to use the dough hook attachment. All right, I'll give it a mix, and then I'll take a look. And as you can see here, definitely too sticky, still sticking to the sides of the bowl. Needs more flour. So at that point, I'll add a little at a time until I have the perfect consistency. And what that is is just enough flour to make it pull away from the sides and form a very, very supple, very soft, slightly sticky dough. And when it gets to that point, you want to let that knead for at least five or six minutes. And again, you can always add flour, much harder to add liquid. So that's why I don't like to dump in all the flour. Okay, so after five or six minutes of kneading, mine looked like this. By the way, my hands are lightly dusted with flour, and that feels amazing. You can tell when you've done a dough right, it just feels incredibly supple and sexy. At that point, I'm going to add a few drops of olive oil to the bowl. All right, I'm going to oil the surface of the dough. And what we're going to do is we're going to cover this with foil and let it double in size. That should take around two hours. Although no guarantees, might be a little less, might be a little longer, but you're going to check. All right, so that's what mine looked like, doubled in size. We're going to remove that from the bowl onto a floured work surface. Go ahead and sprinkle some more flour on top. And then we're going to press it down with our hands, and this is for two reasons. Number one, we want to knock all the air out of it. And number two, we want it into some kind of flat shape that we can cut eight pretty equal size pieces. So that's what I did here. And once you've cut your dough into eight pieces, you're simply going to form these small round loaves. Now, don't stress out too much about this. You could just roll these into a ball if you want. But the official method is to kind of pull the dough from the top down and tuck it up underneath the bottom. So I'm just turning the dough. I'm kind of stretching the top with my thumbs, tucking it up underneath. And I'm just going around and around. And what you'll get is a nice round shape with a very smooth top. And that is it. All right, once your eight little rounds are formed, you're going to cover that with some plastic wrap and let it sit there for about 30 minutes. And 30 minutes later, it's going to look like that. Yes, they will rise a little bit. And you can see my plastic sticking a little bit. You should probably oil that first. I forgot to tell you. And at that point, we are ready to roll our pita breads. So I'm going to take one piece of dough. Again, I'm using a floured surface. I'm going to pat it flat. A little more flour on top. Not too much, just enough so it doesn't stick. And then we're going to roll that out to approximately a quarter inch thick. And by the way, I'm just going to roll out one to get started here. And as they're cooking, I'll roll out other ones so those are resting while I'm actually grilling the first ones. So that's just about perfect right there. And then the last step before we grill these, I want you to let that sit there for five minutes. And you'll notice I'm covering the other dough with a towel so it doesn't dry out. All right, so once your rolled out pita bread has rested for five minutes, we're going to head over to the stove where I have a preheated cast iron skillet on medium high heat. It's been lightly brushed with olive oil. And we're going to place in our pita bread, and we're basically just going to grill it for two to three minutes per side. And that's really all there is to it. So I'm going to go a couple minutes on that side. I'm going to give it a flip, cook it a couple more minutes on that side. And then I'm going to flip it back over to the original side. And you're going to see something that hopefully you see in your pan. That would be the puffin. All right, both sides are going to kind of separate in the center. And it's going to fill with hot air, and it's going to puff up. So I'm just giving this another 30 seconds or so on each side, mostly just to show you the puffing. 
So that's completely normal and desirable. And after it's cooked for about three minutes per side, and hopefully you got a little bit of inflation, we're just going to pile those up on a plate as we cook them. And that's pretty much it. Now, what you just saw would be fairly typical of what you're going to see in your pan. Although once in a while, you're going to get this. That's right. The full balloon. Some of them will just separate perfectly in the center and you'll have one big air pocket. So that's kind of like your best case scenario. And I should also add that you don't have to flip back and forth as many times as I am. I'm just doing this to show off my extreme puffiness. And by the way, don't get discouraged if you don't get the full puff. You'll see when these are done, the insides are going to look great anyway. So whether you get partial puffage or full inflation, you're going to be fine and these are going to be delicious. So bottom line, if you grill both sides for about three minutes and it gets kind of blistered and golden brown like that, you're good. That's all you need to do. And once you've cooked your pitas and they're cool enough to handle, you are done. And you are about to experience one of the great bread products in the history of the world. And you can see here as I tear into one, how those layers have separated in the center. And you get that signature pocket. And by the way, this was the original hot pocket. So it all started with this. And of course, the great thing about pockets, they're fun to fill. And for me, it was tzatziki on this day. But I'm sure you'll have no trouble whatsoever thinking of things to stuff your pitas with. Oh, and by the way, if there's a couple listening in the audience by the names of Mary and Paul, you guys should quit your jobs, buy a food truck, sell sandwiches made on this bread, and call it Pita Paul and Mary's. That is a million dollar idea right there. So to Paul and Mary, I say you're welcome. And to the rest of you, I say I really hope you give this delicious homemade flatbread a try. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with Inside Out Grilled Cheese Sandwich. Actually, it should be called Inside and Out Grilled Cheese because we have cheese in the inside, as you can see, but we also have crispy, crunchy, caramelized cheese on the outside. This is the ultimate grilled cheese sandwich. I'm going to show you how to make it. Take some real butter, melt it in a pan. You're going to need a nice nonstick pan for this. And I don't know why people try to spread cold butter when they make these things and they tear up the bread. Melt the butter in the pan, much easier. By the way, there's only one choice for grilled cheese. That, of course, is white bread. Check the ingredient label. You wanna make sure there's no fiber. Save your wheat bread for the turkey sandwiches. And there's only one cheese, extra sharp cheddar cheese. I know, I know. And what about American cheese? I said, there's only one cheese for this sandwich. That, of course, is not cheese. I'm using grated just because I had it, but this will work with slices of cheddar also. So we put our portion inside. We flip the top over. Now that top, was just in that hot pan. So I'm gonna put some additional grated cheddar on top of that. The heat from that butter is gonna melt the cheese slightly. I'm gonna add a little more butter to the pan. I'm gonna flip it over so the cheese is down. And I'm gonna do the same thing to this side, about a tablespoon or so of grated cheese. And basically we're gonna to toast that slowly. I'm on medium low heat. You don't wanna to go too high here. You don't want the cheese to burn. You want it to get crispy and caramelized. All right, so it was about three or four minutes on that side. I flip it over so I can crisp up the other side's cheese. And you can hear how crispy that gets. It really is just truly amazing. You know that cheese that drips from the pizza and kind of burned onto the edge of the crust and it's all crispy and crunchy and delicious and everyone kind of, you know, maneuvers to get that piece? This is like a whole sandwich of that effect. Anyway, there you go. Inside out grilled cheese sandwich. I mean, look at that. Cheese on the inside. Crispy, crunchy cheese on the outside. This thing is cheesier than karaoke night on Jersey Shore. At one point, I was, let's just say, involved in a group of cooks that were not only hungry, they partook in things that made them extra, extra hungry. They have given this grilled cheese sandwich their stamp of approval. So you know it's gotta be good. So anyway, go to the site. There's not ingredients. It's bread, cheese, and butter. It's a technique, but go to the site anyway. And as always, enjoy.